Hello and welcome again, my friends, to the next episode of The Podcast, a cannabis podcast for budding enthusiasts. As always, this episode was brought to you by our amazing sponsors, the one and only Seeds Here Now. All the best seeds in the game, guarantee on both satisfaction and germination. Why would you go anywhere else? You're going to go check them out, I know it. Likewise, the one and only Radio Ridge Nursery. You got an itch for some killer clones? Don't have time to hunt them? Go check them out. They've got you covered. Seriously, all the best exclusive cuts. Go see them right now. Likewise, a big thank you to the one and only 420 Australia and Organic Gardening Solutions holding down the fort down under with all the best organic gardening products and 420 apparel you would ever need. As always, a huge shout out to our Patreon crew. You guys are the lifeblood of the show. We appreciate you so very, very, very much. As always, big shout out to the Dragonfly family, spreading that organic, regenerative, one love message. A huge, huge, huge thank you to Greensleeves Merchantile, the one and only. Check them out for all your design needs. They make some killer, killer, killer graphic designs. You see it on Bodhi, Mountain Organics, my new logo, heck, what can't they do? Our episode today is the one and only ghost of always be flowering genetics. Here to talk history, set a few stories straight, and let you know what he's got planned in store for everyone. Let's get into it. Alrighty, friends, a big thank you and welcome to the next guest on the show, the CEO of Always Be Flowering. Thanks so very much to Ghost for coming on. Appreciate it, man. Thanks for having me on here. Not a problem, my friend. So, first question we ask people these days, what are you currently smoking on? Uh, right now, we're smoking on some PK Sherb that we made. So, it's the Malibu PK with the Reverse Sunset Sherbert. And before that, some tricks by my buddy Grow Low Key, uh, GG4 Mendo Breath that he hunted. Wow, interesting. There's, uh, there's a lot going on there. So, I mean, first of all, tell us about the Sunset Sherb. How would you describe the crosses you made with that one? Um, I'd say the Sunset Sherb crosses have all been pretty beneficial in terms of what it added to the structure. It's a really interesting plant. Um, probably the plant that I've been most excited about since cookies. And I actually passed on it for a couple of years because I wasn't interested in hearing anything about it, mostly because I didn't really think that it would be better than the cookies in any way, shape or form. It just seemed kind of like derivative. So I passed on it for a while until I actually got to try a sample and I was impressed by it. It's uh, got the creamy kind of deep musky flavor and it's a little bit less cookie doughy dominant and i like the yield on it the structure on it the growth habit super super proper plant in terms of how it grows and stretches and the yields from it um <clears throat> i'd say you know it's probably added a lot to the crosses and with the pk being lower yielding a little bit more finicky of a plant, you find that what the crosses of it produce are hardier, more vigorous plants. Yeah, that sounds really good. And I've, I've got to admit, I've actually never tried pure sherbet. That's why I'm always interested to hear people's take on it. But to cross over the other side of things, you mentioned you crossed it to the, the pure kush. I'm always interested because there's so many different pure kushes. Is the Malibu your personal favorite one? So I, I honestly think that a lot of them are very, very similar, if not identical. I think sometimes when people see them, what all they're really seeing is just different growers' examples of a similar plant. At this point with the OGs in general, which I'm sure you've seen a good amount when you've been when you've been out west, it's very, very similar. I think there's really only a couple of different profiles that stand out. There's the more like gassy lemony one, like the SFV. There's the more earthy one, like the Malibu. And then there's kind of what you find in um, a good example recently was like the Black Triangle from Bodhi, that Triangle uh, ADAG13 hash plant. Very, very dank, like what I call like a traditional Kush type profile. And the Malibu and the Topanga, honestly, a lot of them when I've seen them, they're very, very similar. So I can't really say 
that there would be much of a difference between them. Somebody who would probably be better suited to speak on that might be the doctor from Archive. He might have seen more. I mean, I've seen the Malibu um, when I was in San Diego in like the early 2000s. And when I've seen the Topanga brought up, very, very similar in my opinion. And I know there's, I think there's the Hollywood PK too is what they're calling it as well. Yeah, there's a there's a stack of different ones. I guess the thing I'm most interested in is, do you think that the more lemon-based OGs came maybe from an S1 of, say, the the more earthy, the more pure Kush type ones? Or do you think maybe it was the other way around? Or do you think they just evolved independently? That's a good question. I mean, I, I would think that they came from the more earthy ones just because I kind of feel like that's the base of that genetic so it would make sense to me that an outlier might be the more lemony one. And the lemony ones um, are very, very popular for a specific reason because they have, that, they have that gassy profile, but they also have that stick to your palate flavor that pretty much cuts through anything. And so I feel like it was probably an outlier of the earthier cushions that people were probably getting back in the day. Yeah, that certainly seems to make sense. And then, so I guess to kind of bring this a little bit full circle, a lot of people often talk about feeling like there's a Kush component within Girl Scouts and by extension um, within the Sherbs. Do you see that yourself? And if so, what type of Kush influence do you think is within the Sherb? So at least with the Girl Scout cookies, I would say when you look at it and the way that it grows, it grows very, very similar to the SFVs. Um, In terms of just the way the flower sets, the size of the flowers on them, the internodal spacing on it, and the long petioles that you see on them. If you've ever seen like the OGs grown or whatnot, they don't require a lot of plucking because they don't they don't pull out they don't put out a lot of leaves. They stretch a whole lot. And that's similar to what we first saw in the forum. With the Sherb, I could see it as well. It's just selected away from that to a plant that stacks a little bit more, is a little bit tighter, puts out fatter flowers that the colas are, you know, three or four flowers set together. Not not kind of like what you see with the SFVs or the OGs. And it's firmer. The The branches aren't as floppy. With the OGs, they, you know, they require a lot of work because, you know, they, they want they want to get all kind of over the place. They require a lot of maintenance on them. Yeah, okay. And so, overall, are you put off by these types of structures? Because that's a common complaint we hear from some people. Mm, yes and no. It, I think it really just depends on what it is you're trying to achieve. I mean, a properly grown OG is one of the best flowers you'll ever see. So to me, it's worth it. And there's a reason why it's stuck around so long. I think part of why we stopped seeing the OGs in the kind of volume that we used to see them in is just because the price dropped on the market. And so you know, it wasn't worth growing anymore. It was worth growing something that was a heavier yield or that required less work, that was less finicky. So for me, personally, I love a phenomenal OG and I've never seen a plant with better structure, let's say, that actually delivered the same type of flower. So if you could find it in something that had better structure and growth habits, I would absolutely take it. But Having never really seen anything like that myself, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm saying it, it had, it stuck around for a long time for a reason. And I know Inspecta has done, um, some S1 work with the triangle and the chem 91 and still the, the plants still look, even though he's got some that stack a little bit better, it looks like there's, they still have the same viney structure. It just requires a lot of maintenance to them. Yeah, certainly. So you just got to grow it properly. So you raised a, a really interesting point, which is kind of on a very different topic but i'd love to quickly go there where you mentioned that although these ogs were elite and they're amazing flower people stopped growing them because they kind of fell out of favor and i witnessed this firsthand when i was in the states whereby i had a bag of what was meant to be some sort of like exotic type of cookie type of thing you know and it was grown it looked nice but it had no terps had no flavor was really quite bland but it looked pretty good and then next to it was um, a bag of the the clone only headband that's the same one that Mr. Bob has. So I know that it's like a really good one and that the smell was just super piney, lemony, gassy, like everything you'd want. The flavor was on point. And I'm having this talk with people and they're like, yeah, th- these bags would go for about the same price. And I was like, what? But like the headband's clearly way better. 
And they were like, yeah, but people have smelled that one before. Like, they're used to that smell, you know. Do you feel like that's a problem within the consumer market that we can get to this point where shittily grown exotics are fetching the same or more than like a really killer tried and tested clone only but just because of like a name and a hype thing they're willing to go with the the exotic one yeah i mean i think i think we're already there you know at this point there's a lot of what what people are terming exotics a term that they're using pretty loosely now but there's a lot of those going around and literally just just putting it, I mean, honestly, at this point, just putting it in the right, in the right bag makes all the difference. And there is, there is a segment of the market that will pay for that. And the, the general populace doesn't really know the difference at all. So the staples, like, I mean, I don't know if you remember the J1. I used to love the J1. And it was a phenomenal flower, really, really good high, nice taste. People do not like Jack. They've seen so much Jack, especially in Cali, that they, they don't want to see it anymore. They're over it. Um, so I think like the higher end market, they want, I mean, if you've noticed there's, you know, do si do cross with gelato and, you know, do si do cross with sherb. And that's really what people want. I mean, I made something pretty weird a, a couple years ago and it has no traction. Um, it's a Vietnam black tie grand doggy perp crossed with a grand doggy perp banana limon. Uh, and, you know, yeah. And that, that was a cross that, that took a long time to make. I made, you know, I selected the limon from, I selected the limon male. Um, I hit it to the banana cut we had. I found a male in that and hit it to a grand doggy perp female. Then I found a male from that. And then separate from that, I had uh, selected a Vietnam black tie from Ace and hit that with a grand doggy perp male and then selected a female from that and then worked together that female and the, and the, and the other male. And uh, it's a whole lot of work in there. And really, nobody really has any interest in it. I mean, it's, you know, a couple of people that I know that 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 do care about quality flower, they've told me they've grown it and they've told me it's some of the most unique terps they've ever seen. And they love it. But generally speaking, if you put something like that on the market, number one, most people you tried to explain all those genetics to them, they they would just go right over their head. They would get a blank look on their face. But if you just tell them, oh, it's Girl Scout Cookie crossed with OG Kush, okay, they probably know those things. And they're just going to go for what they know versus, you know, what something completely unique and different. And that's not, you know, it's it's kind of where we're at now where people will take a poorly grown example of some kind of exotic that looks good or photographs well. I mean, honestly, people are buying things because they can take a picture of it and post it on their Instagram. So if, if the headband smells phenomenal to you in person, has a great effect, but the purple punch, whatever cross looks good and they can photograph it and put it on their Instagram and get a bunch of likes, that's what they're going to do. Most people, I mean, that's what they're going to do. All things being equal. So, yeah, no, I, I totally get that. Do you feel like this is going to ultimately negatively affect everyone in the growers start growing out these strains and we maybe lose some of these better ones, like objectively better, but just not demanded? I do. Um, there's been a huge shift in terms of um, people cultivating varieties that are photogenic because they want them to look good on Instagram. Some plants don't photograph well. No matter how you grow them, like the Chem D is kind of is one of those plants. It doesn't photograph well. It doesn't really, I mean, it looks okay in a bag. It can be done right, as it were, but it's never going to look like a gelato sherb cross would look. It's never going to have that bag appeal. It's not going to have the purple tones that photograph well. So there's a lot of genetics that are getting lost off. And I mean, even, even when I've tried to share genetics with people to help back up some of the work, they don't care. Because if it's not something that they can immediately put into production, most people don't want to do it. And so there's, there's really, it costs a lot of money. It takes a lot of time to back up all these genetics. And I know that's something that Inspector could relate to. It's a conversation that we've had here and there about that. Just It's a big commitment to do all that work and keep all that together. And most people don't want it. I mean, a, sim- a similar example is a plant we have called the Lucy. It's a Chem 91 Butterscotch Hawaiian Very, very unique terpene profile. Um, Not the highest yielder, a little bit finicky, whatnot, but it's, you know, it's not something that I don't think anyone in my circle has kept it around. I think one person that operates a rec facility has it 
And other than that, it's not a plant that anyone really wants. But when I hit it with the tricks and a friend of mine has grown them out now, the owner of the facility came by and when he was checking out all the different stuff that they were growing, what he remarked about amongst, you know, maybe six or seven different breeders work that they had going there was that the patch of work that was, that they, that had, that had come from my work, all the strange plants that my friend had selected independently were the most unique profiled plants he had seen. And one, one was the Lucy. He said he never smelled anything like it before. And for me, that's, that's a big part of why I keep those plants around because although they're of zero value to most people, um, mostly because they don't really know what they're worth. They don't really see the value in it. They don't understand that if you cross it into something else, you're opening up a whole new gene pool. Like, but if you just hit gelato to do si yeah, you're going to get a bunch of plants that smell similar, that give kind of somebody in Iowa, let's say, the ability to grow that type of a plant and smell that type of a profile. But at the end of the day, you're not really doing anything special. You're not really opening up the possibility of anything unique. I like to take things from the far end of the spectrum and combine them together. And that's, I think, where you're going to find really, really different plants. But somebody has to keep those plants around. And you, you literally, you, nobody wants them. You can't find people that, you, you could, you'd have to pay people to keep them around for you if you can't keep them. God, so many things you just said, I just so deeply relate to. <laughs> like, yeah, I know what you mean. And what I wanted to first ask you, because I've got so many things I need to ask you in relation to that. First thing, the Chem 91 Butterscotch Cross, is that from Bodhi or Rado? No, so that's not Rado's Butterscotch. I don't, even, I don't know the lineage of his Butterscotch. This was made by someone named Poor White Farmer. Um, he was off IC Mag years ago. And... I believe it might have been from Reef. Um, I believe the Butterscotch Hawaiian came from Reef, and he found a male in there, hit the Chem 91, and then somebody named Easy Rasta selected the clone. He passed it to a couple of our friends on ICMAG, and that's how I ended up getting it. And I don't know that either of them are, I mean, they may still be alive, but I don't, neither of them, I've, I haven't seen either of them active in years. So I'm not sure um, where where that work lies. But yeah, no, that's not from Rado. I'm not even sure what the lineage on his butterscotch is, to be honest. I don't know if you might know what it is. Yeah, no, I would probably have to look into it before I say something incorrect. So I'm trying to, trying to vet some of the more <laughs> random things I say recently. So I'll hold <laughs> off on that one. I remember seeing a post with that Chem 91 butterscotch cross in it. And then I remembered seeing in that same post, and you also just mentioned it, that there was like a, I think it was cross to tricks. And yes. Yeah, I crossed it to the tricks. Yeah. And so I wanted to ask you a little bit about tricks. I noticed that sometimes you refer to it as GB6 tricks. What does that mean? So originally, I believe that when Loki selected the plant, he got it as, as Gorilla Breath. Um, that He did a project with Gromer. And there was a bunch of work that came out of that. And that's one of those plants. And when he selected it, um, I think it was just the Gorilla Breath 6. And he named it Trix because of the flavor profile on it. Um, the way, like the way, like the kind of the smell that it gives off. And so the shortened version is just GB6 Trix rather than Gorilla Breath 6 Trix. Ah, that makes sense. As a quick little side note, what do you think of our friend Groma? You know, I, I've had a few people come on the show saying, well, he's very blatantly ripped off Gage Green. But then on the other hand, people seem to turn a bit of a blind eye to that and, you know, are friendly with him. What's your take on that situation? I mean, yeah, he obviously did. So that's, I don't think that's up for discussion at this point because the, the work was all based on the Mendo breath. And I think he has a line recently that's just another Gage Green kind of rip. I think he took, um, I forget what, a Grateful Breath or something and started a whole other line with that. So, but yeah, I mean, he, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things where it would have been previously frowned upon, clearly not frowned upon now. I'm sure he made a whole bunch of money for himself. And he sells them at a, at a low price point because there's really no work involved in them. I mean, you know, I could take a pack from, you know, Archive right now and do the same thing. And people, I mean, there's people who have done that with with work that was put out with my work. So it's kind of one of those things where, you know, it's he it gave people access to something. He did it in numbers. He did it in volume. He cut the price real low. So personally, you know, for me, no. But 
for people who are just trying to make some money, I totally get it. It makes sense. It was there to be had and people clearly support him. And I mean, the work that's come from it hasn't been bad because, you know, it's, I mean, it's a lot of it is do do and Mendo Breath, you know, do do from Archive and Mendo Breath from Gage, both, both, you know, made in collaboration with NorCal and that OGKB clone. So not really, I mean, not, not something that I would do to be honest, but not mad at him either because I'm sure he made a pile of money off it and is still making a pile of money off of it. There's a lot of people out there doing work with integrity that are broke. So, yeah. you know, you kind of, kind of look at it and see really at the end of the day, like who's really winning there. It's interesting that exactly what you said holds true. In my opinion, the best clone that exists in Australia is a Jelly Breath clone from in-house genetics. And that's just um do si do cross mendo breath you know it's just his version his feminized version of essentially the peanut butter breath from groma but yeah you can't deny it's some really nice weed but i just wanted to loop back for a moment the reason why all of this stimulated my interest initially especially in regards to that gorilla breath was that i had heard rumors of other well-known strains been given the same genetics and i probably need to explain this a little bit specifically i'd heard that smellboat's rainbow ssog was in fact just gorilla glue for mendo breath and i'd asked him about it and he was like what no way like neither of those plants are you can't even see any traits from those plants in this thing but what it made me realize was when i was hearing these rumors it was just kind of like two really popular strains thrown together. It was almost as if like people didn't know what a certain cross was. So they were like, oh, it's probably like GG4 cross Mendo Breath. Like as in like it was just two popular things you could throw together and imply that someone's just kind of chucking these two popular things together. Have you ever heard of any other strains being called like, oh, it's probably GG4 Mendo Breath, even though like it doesn't really appear to be or anything like that? Or is that just my own little weird experience? Mm, no, yeah, and I, I mean, I'm kind of familiar with Smellboat, but I had never heard that about that particular cross. I'm sure that somebody else has done a GG4 Mendo Breath. I would be surprised if they hadn't. Um, I'm sure there's a GG4 Dosi Do out there. I could I would bet on that one for sure. The Mendo Breath, you know, it wasn't. It, it was. They both kind of came at the same time, and then one ended up obviously exceeding the popularity of the other significantly, in my opinion. That being the Dosi Do. I mean, we actually we actually were the ones that that sold that clone originally, that NorCal cut. Um, when that cut actually came out, it was through a delivery service that I had in SF at the time, and we released the Dosi Do NorCal cut, the number six, and the Mendo Breath cut, uh, which was the platinum. And those, you know, one one really took off, which was that Dosi Do, and the other one didn't really trend as much, was the Mendo Breath. So. Really, though, I think the person that's worked with the Mendo Breath the most, obviously besides Gage, has has been Gromer because he worked with it for a long time. It has to be years now. Yeah, I don't really know that anyone else has really worked with it that significantly. Yeah, well, I mean, I guess just to kind of wrap up this little saga we've been talking about, what are your thoughts on Gage? Uh, I mean, they're weird. There's no denying that. I don't think there's. Um, they're a little bit strange. Um, so I'm friends with NorCal and NorCal and uh, my buddy Frost Boss and my buddy Unknown Prophet and myself, we all go back a long way in the Bay Area, the four of us. And NorCal was how I came to know about Gage. Um, but he's he's a really good guy. He He's open to working with a lot of people and he worked with Gage in some way, shape or form. My understanding of their relationship was that it was not very beneficial to him. And so in that regard, to me, not really people that I'm a huge fan of simply because if my friend says that it didn't go right, I know the kind of guy he is. So I imagine it's on their side. Plus, I've seen them caught up in all kinds of all kinds of online debating and whatnot. Um, And people who debate online are not people that I want to associate with. So the work is interesting. They seem weird. Um, and I personally have never run any of their work besides the Mendo Breath cuttings that NorCal gave me. But I know a lot of people like their work. So, you know, I think I think one of them is a flat earther. That's a little bit strange to me. And then just the way that they present themselves online is kind of off-putting to me. And the reality is besides the Mendo Breath, I don't really know any of their other work that I'm intrigued by. 
Yeah, that's an interesting point. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest, there's a few of their crosses I've seen that do catch my eye, particularly that high school sweetheart one, but um, I agree with you. They're, they're an interesting crew, and our friend Michael Fong, the Flat Earther, he's another interesting chap, and I wouldn't be surprised if one day we get him on the show. I think it'd be a cool chat. But anyway, let's let's take it back now. We've been having a good little detour here. Let's go back to our original first question, which we normally start the show with. What was your first experience with cannabis? Wow. Yeah. Uh, my first experience with cannabis was with some friends of mine when I was younger. One of their parents was a deadhead. And I was spending the night over there and they stole they stole a little bit of flour from them. And we sat up after everyone went to bed and smoked it, you laid, laid down and had that typical first experience where you're wondering, like, am I feeling anything or what is this? Um, everything went fine. Didn't think anything of it. Went to bed the next day, woke up, felt a little bit different. Just thinking, OK, well, clearly it's not it's not what the D.A.R.E. program and everybody else said it was. I think I was about mm, like 13 at the time. And then I really didn't didn't smoke much after that. It took um, a couple years before I really got into smoking because it didn't it didn't really grab me. And then I remember um, meeting with some friends uh, where I was living in Miami at the time and grabbing some flour from one of their older brothers. He actually had some blueberry and remember smoking that and being like, oh, yeah, OK, like I get it now. And pretty much obsessed with that. I mean, I think we ended up going to see a movie at the mall. And I, we were waiting for the movie. We went up in the parking garage to smoke right before the movie. I walked back in. There were some benches in front of the movie theater. I remember laying down and telling them when it was time to go in, I said, no, nah, I'm good. You guys can go. <laughs> I'm good. Um, and they told me, like, you can't lay out here, man. You have to, you have to come into the movie theater. <laughs> so I went in with them. Um but I loved it. I completely fell in love with it. It's, I mean, it's a, it's a plant that, you know, it, it changed my life. I've been dedicated to this plant for, you know, over 20 years now. And in spite of everything else, any little detours I've taken in life, I've always circled back to the plant constantly. It's, it's, I mean, it changed my life clearly, just like a lot of the people that you probably speak to. Clearly we've dedicated a long, long like a lot of time and energy into this. So yeah, I've been, I was kind of spoiled though, cause I'd never seen I'd never seen regs before. And in, in Florida, there was really only like regs or like, like, like nugget, you know, it was like, Oh, you either had, you either had crippy or you had regs. And I, I was spoiled cause I'd only smoked like, I'd only smoked crippy. I only smoked like kind butter, whatever you want to call it. I only smoked like nicer indoor flour. And then I remember the first time I saw some regs, um, we all, we all faded in on, I'm supposed to be like, I think like a quarter pound. And when my friends asked me to fade in on it, I was kind of surprised by like the small amount of money that it was. And when they showed up with it and started breaking it up, I didn't even know what the seeds were. I was completely confused about the stems, the seeds, all of that. I tried to take one hit of a blunt they rolled and I said, no, I'm good. Um, I'm just going to hit my pipe in my little jar of weed that I brought with me. (laughs) Wow, there you go. And was that, when you say regs, was that kind of like brickweed or just like not as good as kind? Brickweed. Brickweed, pressed Miami brickweed. Yeah, wow. And so, I know that back in those days, names weren't a big thing, but do you remember the first name strain you ever smoked? So, my friend's brother would get blueberry. That was the first thing that I actually smoked. Um, And then in Florida, there was Juicy Fruit, which was like another one that was popular. I want to say the other one was called Orange Crush. Um, and there was like one more that I can't remember off top, but really there was only, I don't know how it is in Australia, but, um, when in Florida there, you only could really get from people that you knew. And if it wasn't like brickweed basically out of like some suspect spot, um, it was through the same kind of contacts and they just had the same type of stuff. And so you really didn't have much of an option. And so we would get a lot of that juicy fruit, that orange crush, I forget what some of the other ones were. Um, And then a friend of mine actually grew some of the first stuff from seed I ever saw, which was they had brought back some shishka berry seeds. And so that was that was like the first actual something from seed that I where I knew the people that actually grew it. That's cool. Okay, so did you have like an inclination towards spice of life at that point, given shishka berry kind of opened your eyes or was that like an afterthought? 
to be honest, I didn't even know who they were. Um, I was so paranoid about any kind of online searching for anything at that time that I didn't want anything to do with it. And in Florida, if you knew someone like you just, you just didn't say anything because the people that were growing were so quiet about it that you, you just, you, you couldn't say anything about anything to anybody. So it wasn't even really, it wasn't really even a conversation that you could have with someone to even ask questions about. It was more like, here, I've got this, take it. You don't want it. Okay. You can't have it now because you took too long. You asked questions. They didn't like it. So you just, you know, you had, it was like, if you didn't grow up with certain people, you were just, you were excluded from certain circles. You just weren't welcome. So I didn't even know about Steve or Spice of Life or any of that, but I have, I have enjoyed some of his work. I like the blue satellite from him. Um, I would like to grow some shishka berry at some point. It's kind of a shame because a lot of that flower nowadays with the way the rec markets are moving here in the States, they're not really desirable because a lot of those higher terpene, interesting different varieties, they don't, they don't test over 20%. And consumers in the stores, that's, that's what they're really obsessed with is like varieties over 20%. And, you know, if, if something has a really, really unique terpene profile, but it tests 13 or 14%, it's going to be eliminated. That's another thing that's going to affect the gene pool going forward is like this focus on commercial breeding is really, is really going to change what people are doing. I think it's interesting because I think it's this, the same situation in the States, but it's certainly the case down under that there's this whole kind of renaissance and explosion of craft beers. And there's this idea of like people are moving away from just your stock standard commercial stuff and looking for that more boutique type of thing. Do you think that'll ever happen with cannabis or the current trend you just described where people are kind of a bit ignorant of what they're actually looking for as a consumer? Do you think that will continue? I think I think it might happen. Um, I think it'll take time. And by then, I think we'll have lost a lot of the genetics. There'll, there'll be people here and there that have preserved some things. There'll be some seeds that we'll be able to pull from. But I do feel like there's a lot of diversity that's getting lost and work that's not being done. One day, consumers might might be educated enough, might be interested enough in asking for that. But currently, with, with the way the regulatory landscape is set up, it's very difficult to operate. And I think that in the future, when we're able to actually have interstate commerce, so if, you know, if a facility was located, let's say, in you know, Arizona, but it could ship all over the country, kind of like you know, a small vineyard might, I think you'll have more access to that boutique market the same way that the breweries do. But right now, with the way it's set up and, you know, just kind of having to operate within a state and comply with the local regulations. And if you want to expand into another state, you have to set up another facility. It's just not it's it's geared towards rich people. It's geared towards the wealthiest people. And right now what they're doing is they're grabbing the hugest piece of the markets possible. They're setting up all across the country. So, they're, you know, they'll be everywhere before they give the craft people kind of a chance to expand. And Oregon has a small craft market, but it, it's been brutal. And Oklahoma's about to go through the same thing. A lot of people are popping up over there because it's so inexpensive. But what, what's going to happen is, is the same thing that happened in Oregon. The market's just going to get decimated and a lot of people are going to lose are going are to lose what they've invested. Not everyone is going to survive that. But I do think that Oregon is a place where you might see that craft market. And, you know, I could point to brands like Resin Ranchers. Um, smaller companies that feed, you know, they understand the market and they're not, they're not overproducing. They could expand. They choose not to. Um, they've found a happy medium and a way to survive within that. But they also had deep, deep roots in the medical scene before the recreational market hit. So they had those relationships in place. They had local connections. They were able to make the transition. And I'm sure at some point, you know, if we spoke to them, they would tell you it wasn't easy but they managed to make it work and people know, you know, and our archive is a good curator of local kind of craft products in Oregon. If people want to, if you can get your product on their shelf, it says something about your company. Yeah. Right. I remember when I visited the Oregon store a few years ago, they definitely had some nice flour there. Something I forgot to mention earlier, when you were talking about J1, how good is J1? I love J1. I can't believe I did. I love J1. People, people, don't, people it's, maybe it's me and you then, but people don't, people don't seem to care for it. I think it's a phenomenal flower. I think it's resinous. It's flavorful. It grows impeccably. It yields well. I love the high from it. 
I feel like a lot of people, they, they want the narcotic high nowadays. They have for years, but they especially seem to want it now. I don't know if it's just the current state of affairs or whatnot. <laughs> but I think the J1 is a phenomenal flower. I mean, I'm, I, was, I grew that plant for a long time, and I was, I was bummed when I lost it. Um, I, know, I know it still exists. I know some people still grow it. And really, I mean, it's, it's a jack profile with better structure, better flower, better finishing time, better bag appeal. I think it's amazing. I love it. Yeah, the thing I noticed about it is no one breeds with it ever. That's true. That's true. Um, I would like to at some point. I definitely need to make an effort to get that cut back in the rotation. But yeah, if you look around, you don't see any crosses with it. Part of that might be because I think people wonder that if you put Jack into something, is anyone going to want it? And it's weird. A lot of breeding is done with that kind of intention. Like, what is the market going to want? And for years, you know... I mean, even even before I started, you know, offering seeds publicly, I just bred whatever I wanted. I didn't really think about what people wanted. I thought about what what I wanted to see. And I mean, that's that's why I bred the stuff that I've made, like has yeah. nothing to, had, had literally zero consideration for the market at all. You know, but I learned. I mean, I, it's easy to see like what people want and what they don't want. But I think I think a plant like the J1 just if you tell people there's jack in something, especially in the Bay Area, the face they're gonna make is not is not one of approval. <laughs> well, that's almost like a bit of a good little segue. So if we loop back to you were talking about how you'd started smoking, what was the progression like and the transition from say smoker to grower for you? Yeah, so I started smoking. Um, Flor- I, you know, I grew up in Florida. It's a pretty difficult state to operate in. I think you know you find a lot of people in this, especially on the West Coast, that were from Florida, because you had to have a real passion for it, and that's something that that doesn't get tamped out. I mean, at the time, um, I was going to school in Gainesville, and I was growing. I, I had, a friend of mine had started growing when he came back from Amsterdam, and when I saw it, I had seen a setup before. I didn't even know what it was when I saw it. A friend of mine took me to a friend's basement in Chicago and I went downstairs. He, you know, he said, Hey, it's my guy. He's cool. Whatever, whatever. He takes me downstairs and I see, um, a makeshift space. I think it honestly, I think it had to be like two by fours and some kind of plastic. It wasn't not anything fancy. And he, he opens it up and I see a bulb in there and some light and some plants. And in retrospect now looking back, I'm like, yeah, they were, they were pretty rough looking. Um, but I didn't know the difference between a metal halide and an HPS, whatever it might be. And I asked him kind of some questions and he was actually making seeds in there. He had a mail in there and he was actually making seeds, which totally random. Um, that kind of surprised me, but it, it kind of stuck with me and it made me think like, wow, you could just, you can just do this. Not having ever seen anyone do it before. It just, I said, yeah, this is something that you, you could do if you just had a little bit of space. So when I got back to Florida, um, I sold a guitar and an amp that I had and I went and bought a 400 watt light and I set up a space at a house that I was renting. Um, and I remember padlocking the door. Um, you know, if we would have some people over here and there, um, then somebody would say something about the smell. I would tell them, Oh, you know, we smoke, we smoke a lot of weed and they would inevitably say that's not what weed smoke smells like. Um, <clears throat> but I remember setting up just a small closet space with a 400 and I got some cuttings from a friend of mine started growing them in there, grew them. And it actually was some reclining Buddha by Soma, um, at the time. And I remember growing it and, um, somebody that I used to, uh, somebody I used to provide, uh, mentioned something about the cherry flavor in the flower, not knowing that I had grown it, not knowing anything about it, supposedly having a cherry type flavor. And I rem- that really stuck with me. And it made me, th- it made me think about all the different possibilities that were, that were out there. And I was in school. I didn't like it. Um, I did not enjoy the whole school system, to be honest. I thought it was kind of a waste of time and money and a money grab for the most part. I think, you know, for certain professions it makes sense, but in general for all kids to go to school just doesn't really make a lot of sense. And so I was growing for about a year and a half out there, and I remember um, just, it was you know, it was mandatory minimums at the time for any kind of cultivation there. So like a single plant was, you know, mandatory minimum. I think it was three to five years. And... Um, at that point, I had I had a friend who had moved to San Diego, and so in talking with him um, and you know my family, they basically said like, hey, if you're going to keep doing this, maybe you should just move out west so you don't go to jail. And uh, 
I packed up, I sold everything and I moved out west and gave it a shot out there in San Diego. That's actually where I got my first taste of like real Southern California, like high grade. Because I used to fly out there all the time. But like living out there and being out there was totally different. You really got to see what was happening. And at the time, there there was a medical scene. This was after 215 had passed. And um, it was very, very different what was happening out there. They had clubs, but they were getting shut down and harassed. San Diego is a beautiful place, but it's very conservative and not very, very cannabis friendly. Although there is a large scene there. But that was where I first started seeing things like the Bull Rider, uh, the P91, the Cat Piss, all that stuff. And um, they grew some, they had some Afghani, whatnot. And I just remember seeing just the sheer volume of flour that was coming out of, out of, out of the area in general. And it really, you know, it stuck with me. And so I had the chance to move out there. I gave it a go. Um, it didn't work out. Uh, a friend of mine got addicted to oxys. So that that kind of went sideways. I don't know how much people have spoken about that kind of stuff. But this business is not easy. Um, the lifestyle is not easy. It's a lot, you know, you might see people that people think are successful. But I don't think people know everything they had to go through. And how many times they had to try. And how many times they didn't quit. Before they were able to see some success. I mean... It's a tough business and, you know, definitely that type of lifestyle at the time, it was not a traditional lifestyle. So, you know, definitely pills and whatnot and everything were around and that's kind of when oxys, I think we're starting to get a hold on people out there. So that didn't really work out. Um, I ended up uh, leaving everything, moving back east, working again, saving some more money and then um, I was kind of over it. Because I hadn't, I hadn't been to NorCal. I was kind of over it. San Diego just reminded me of L.A. and Miami crossed together. And I said, to do that, I'll just go back and live in Miami. I like Miami. And then um, some friends of mine were out in Lake Tahoe. And they invited me out for the summer to go visit out there. They lived on, on what I call perpetual hippie tour. So they just, you know, work, save money, go on hippie tour, come back broke, work, save money. Same thing over and over again. And uh, I went out there to Lake Tahoe and it was stunning. It was beautiful. I'd never seen anything like it. Never seen anything like it. I don't know if you've had the chance to get to Lake Tahoe, but it's beautiful, stunning, you know, impactful. And had a chance to go down to Oakland with my friends. And I remember being at somebody's house, um, at a friend of my friend's house. And they had told him, you know, this is this is my guy. I've been friends for a long time. So everything was fine with me and him. But somebody came by um, with a duffel bag and a bunch of perps, a bunch of perp packs, and which was, you know, huge in the Bay Area at that time. That was like around 2005. 2006 and uh i remember them um you know doing whatever they were doing with the perp packs and then him pulling out like a pound of purple keef and saying like oh, i don't know what to do with this and at that point that's when i chimed in and said you know well you know i'll, I'll take that and he didn't know who i was he was completely thrown off by me the guy sitting on the couch smoking not saying anything saying i'll take that and um but it just it was obvious to me at that point that like i was in the wrong place because I'm in a city right now where people have a pound of purple keef and don't know what to do with it. I'd never seen a pound of purple keef anywhere. Like, so it blew my mind and I was like, yeah, I'm coming back to Oakland. And so, you know, I went home, I worked, saved more money, sold everything I owned and rented a warehouse off Craigslist, not, not having ever seen it. And, uh, just moved out with two duffel bags and, you know, bought some lights and got to work out there and, kind of built up from there. I mean, it definitely, you know, it wasn't, it was not easy, uh, to give it a run. I don't know if you, if you spent any time in Oakland, Oakland is getting gentrified now. It's a lot more cleaned up as it were, but still a rough city. Um, and still, you know, but a place, a place that lives, eats and sleeps, um, high grade cannabis. In my opinion, I know my friends in SoCal might differ, but I think, I think, uh, the Bay area is the epicenter of, of global cannabis. Not even, not even, you know, just in California, but gl globally and no knock on, you know, Humboldt or whatever, the Emerald Triangle, all that stuff. They, they do their thing up there. But if you really, really look at who's been making the waves over the last decade, it's the Bay Area. And if anyone has any claim before that, it's SoCal, you know, with the OGs. But since then, it's been all the Bay Area. I mean, all of it, you know, the cookies the gelatos, the sherbs, everything, all this stuff. It's just been Bay Area, Bay Area, Bay Area for, you know, probably the last seven or eight years, maybe 10 years.
Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, there's there's so many things we can touch on there. The first thing I wanted to do before we move past it, you mentioned the bull rider, the P ninety one, and the cat pierce down in San Diego. Sounds like you were down there when Matt was kind of doing his thing. Matt Riot, were you familiar with him at all, or not really? I I was not. I I avoided any kind of social interaction possible with people that were outside of my circle. Um, I think it's a big reason why I've managed to kind of stay out of trouble. A lot of these guys have had run-ins or had, you know, people snitch on them or whatever it might be or get robbed. And I pretty much avoided everyone. Um, I was connected with one circle of people out there that had access to all of those flowers. They were born and raised in San Diego. So all those guys, you know, had gone to school there. And so they, you know, they all, they all had the local connections for those flowers. Um, and a lot of those flowers, I mean, you don't see them anymore, like anywhere. And even the bull rider, it fell off years and years later. I know people are out there now saying that they still have it and grow it. I'd like to see it to see if, if it is what it is. But I almost think at this point you could just tell people it's bull rider and them having never seen it, they wouldn't know the difference. Because it's just some Afghani, right? Yes, supposedly. You know, not having been there for for it, um, that's my understanding of it. And you know, it didn't have the big, the best bag appeal or anything. It was big flowers. You could tell it yielded. Um, and there was also there was a super silver haze that was being grown out there in Long Beach at the time too. Um, that was phenomenal. I mean, ridiculous. And there was a Cali mist. And I mean, I kind of I kind of miss those days. There there was some flower that you couldn't buy. Like there was such a limited amount. It was already spoken for. People would, would prepay for the flower, which is something that I don't know that if young people even like would understand what that is. Like they would prepay before the harvest so that they could have their their share of that harvest. And there was a super silver haze that was like that. And the, the guy that I knew who would get it, he wouldn't sell any of it. He would only trade me. So I'd have to trade him like this, that, this super silver haze, let's say, that I would get for the Cali mist that he was getting. And it was just like a one-to-one trade. That was it. Like as much as I was willing to give up, that's as much as he was willing to give up. And <clears throat> it was, um, you know, it was different. There was just, there was more limited, limited flower out there at the time. But yeah, no, I didn't, I didn't know Matt. Um, yeah. Seems like he, he seems like he was more social. I mean, definitely. I think he was into like the punk rock scene and whatnot. So he was definitely out there. Um, I was hanging out with Jamaicans and a totally different type of scene in like Mission Beach and PB out there. <laughs> Yeah, cool. Okay. And so then what was your transition from going as just a grower to then starting to make your own seeds? Yeah, so so we were on IC Mag, a bunch of us, and you know, I had tried to buy seeds years ago off like Heaven Stairway or something. Um did they didn't make it. I freaked out. I was in Florida at the time. I said I'm not buying anything else through the mail. I'm over it. Um, and then I knew people that were buying off, off IC mag, off uh, seed bay and seed boutique. And so I said, you know what I said, I'm going to, I'm going to start getting some seeds. And I started just collecting some seeds and sending some money orders here and there and grabbing some stuff. And I actually, the first thing I ever tried to do was I took a mail from a pack of Soma's reclining Buddha and tried to hit a bunch of things. But I learned a valuable lesson from that in that like all, everything that I grew from that was terrible. It was all trash. Um, and I hit it to my bubble jack, the East Coast Sour, and a couple other things, and they were just trash. It was nothing good came from that mail. Um, and so I chucked all those seeds, whatever, whatever, with that. And then some friends of mine um, were doing a lot of outdoor work. And, you know, we were talking about, like, how the Blue Dream would go deep into November. It was a great plan for outdoor cultivation, but they wanted something that would finish faster. And I had some uh, Williams Wonder um, from Reef. And so um, we popped those, found a male, and hit hit the blue dream with that, because we figured, all right, this is going to be a plant that is going to, this is really going to be a phenomenal plant for outdoor cultivation. It should finish faster from the Afghani influence. It should still be resinous. It should still, you know, be real chunky. Hopefully, pick up some resistance to PM and botrytis and whatever it might be. So we started that project, and that's something we worked on over a couple of years, just kind of in our own world nothing to do with any kind of thoughts towards vending seeds or a seed company or anything. It was just something that we worked on collaboratively as a group. And so we worked that for a couple of generations and that's where that wet dream plant came from. And that was my first like realization, like, okay, like, yeah, you can use a male, but they're definitely not all the same. And it doesn't matter what kind of female you cross it to. If the male is trash, 
like the work that comes from that is going to be trash. So we got, we got lucky, you know, we got lucky and the mail that we used was really solid. And from there, you know, we did one further selection and then I've done a couple of open, open populations since then just to kind of spread it out and, uh, see, see what kind of variants we might find in there and not, not bottleneck the gene pool. So that's, you know, that was probably the first actual breeding projects that we did as a group was just a couple of friends with just an intention to breed something that would do better and finish faster. And at the time we weren't even really doing the depths. It was all just the larger full season plants. So we just wanted something that would still, you know, throw down big plants, but finish quicker. And what was your impressions of the Williams Wonder strain? That's something like we frequently reminisce about on the show. Yeah. So I, I we loved it. Um, some of the, when, when I was living in Chicago for a while, I was staying out there for a little bit and, um, the packs that we would get were the willies is what we used to call them. And they were coming out of Oregon at the time, which my understanding is like, that's where that variety was developed. And I loved it. I mean, beautiful, like electric green resinous flowers, large, like nowadays, you know, it would be hard, it would be hard to really find something comparable to it. But because, you know, a lot of what's popular now is like the candy stuff and the fruit sweet stuff or whatever it might be. It was like a real hashy plant, um, but potent, you know, potent, like the high from it was was what we really, really enjoyed. It's a beautiful, beautiful flower. And that's something that, I mean, you just you don't see it around anymore. There's like, I, I mean, I imagine it might still exist somewhere. I, like, I think Inspect and I have talked about it. There's usually someone in the hill somewhere holding something, but they don't talk to anyone. And so you probably never see it. But that's that's a really old plant that I just don't think that you see anything like that anywhere else anymore. Yeah, certainly. It seems like people are kind of madly looking for any remnants of it. So... Mm -hmm. For the next little bit of chat, I wanted to touch on something which I think everyone will be really interested to hear the story about, which probably a lot of people aren't actually aware, that you were the person who found the forum cut. That's true. Would you be able to give us the backstory on that one? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, people have asked for years. I've just never, like I said, you know, I never really wanted any attention for anything, so... I mean, I think people have uh, people have said that Profit was the one that gave it out, and or my other buddy uh, Frost Boss. Both of them have probably been um, both of them have probably been involved in like the actual story more more than myself publicly. Um, so what happened there was we used to have a get together party, an IC Mag party in Vegas. That was just kind of just for a bunch of us together, like invite only. We would like rent a house and get out there and whatnot. I, I had tried to avoid as much as humanly possible um, going to any of these events just because why, why do I want to be in a building with a bunch of growers? Um, so I had tried to avoid it for a while, but one of our friends had got into some legal trouble and I had helped him out when he got popped and they took all his plants. I always have um, extra like just, I always have an excessive amount of veg plants because you just never know when you're going to need them. And if you need them, I'd rather have them. You can always chop them down. You can always do whatever with them, but you at least have them on deck. So when, when our friend had gotten in trouble and they cut down his garden, taken all his plants and whatnot, I knew when he got out, he was going to need some help. And so I hit him up and just asked if he wanted anything, I could help him out. And so I got him some plants, got him replugged. And he said to me, um, you know, we have this party in Vegas, you should really come out. I hadn't really wanted to go out, but he, he talked me into it. So I ended up going out and I met uh, Frost Boss. And um, I don't think Profit, Profit was there that year the, for, for the first one. But I met Frost Boss and I remember hanging out with him. And, uh, you know, we were both from the Bay. And he had told me about something called cookies. He said, yeah, man, there's something called cookies. Have you heard of it? And I said, no, nah, I never heard of it. And he said, oh, man, it's it's you know, it's special, man. You should check it out. And I was like, yeah, 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 whatever, whatever. Because I was growing nothing but sour and OGs at that time. I didn't really have any interest. I mean, sour and OG had reigned supreme for so long that why would I be interested in anything else, to be honest? Like, I'd seen a lot of people come with other flour. None of it, you know, exceeded the sours or the OGs. So what? What was the point? Um <clears throat> But he had told me about something called cookies and whatnot. And so when, when we got back... Um, he came by my house one day and in his pocket, he had a little smashed up nugget inside a Ziploc bag, like a tiny, tiny little 0 0.3, 0 0.4 nugget. And it was abused. It didn't really look that great. 
Um, it had some purple color to it and whatnot. I didn't think much of it. Um, I broke it up, though. I ground it up, and I put it in my volcano. And so I, I've been vaporizing for a long time. I do it mostly because of the health benefit, but also because it's honestly the most flavorful way to experience flour, in my opinion. If you're just about the terpene profile, if you really just want to know what it tastes like, you know, that's going to be the best way to get that full experience. So I ground it up. I stuck it in the volcano. I vaped it. And instantly, I kind I got what he was talking about. And... I started asking around. Um, he knew the people. He's familiar, and you know he knows all all he knows that whole circle. He's from SF, but he didn't have access to the cut. And so, because I asked, and he said, "Yeah, if we can get it, we should get it." And so, I asked a couple of friends of mine who uh, were actually one of them was the same person that I worked with on the Wet Dream, and they didn't even know what I was talking about. They had no clue. So I, I said specifically, I said it's something called cookies this, that, and the other, ask around and see, see if you can find it. Um, he asked a friend of ours, he didn't know what it was. That friend actually asked another person that they knew, um, who ran a hydro store in the Emeryville area. And he was married to an Asian girl whose family ran a grow spot somewhere in that area. Um, it turned out that although he didn't have it, they did. And we asked about it and they said, oh, you know, we need we need like six grand or five grand or whatever it was at that time. Um, and, you know, we kind of I think we all just kind of looked at each other like, ah, you know, is it really is it worth it? I mean, that's at that, you know, it's a lot of money for a cut, especially at that time. And um, we decided that it was and he basically said he could get a lower price if, you know, if we gave him a cut. So they, they gave us one plant. Um, he took a cutting off of it. My other friend who put it together took a cutting off it. And my friend who had, who had kind of put the whole thing together through these other people, he didn't have a place to keep it. So he gave it to me and said, Hey, hold on to it. Cause he knows if you give it to me, I'm, I'm going to hold on to it. And so I remember getting it and, uh, ramping it up and posting about it actually on IC mag at the time. It's probably the first post about cookies like ever publicly. And I remember posting about it and just saying, hey, I got this Girl Scout cookies, blah, 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 whatever. Um, grew it, you know, started growing it out, whatnot. And it, you know, showed uh, my buddy Frost Boss and Profit the samples of it. And it was cookies. Um, and so we had it at that time. And what happened was I had a small get together at my house and I gave a cutting to four different people. Uh, my buddy Frost Boss cut a cutting. Um, profit got a cutting, um, and two other people that were there got cuttings. And at that point I didn't pass it with any restrictions. I didn't say you can't sell it. I gave it to them for free. I didn't think they were going to sell it. I didn't really see what, you know, what they would, I didn't think that it would end up going the way that it did. And what ended up happening was, yeah, people started hitting them up to buy the cuts. People came up from LA, people came from all over the place Cuttings went to a couple different people from there, and then um, Cuttings made it all the way to the UK. I know um, IC Mag people out there got it, got it through people that we know out here, and it just kind of it just kind of went off. I mean, it got to the point where when people were typing Girl Scout cookies in the search engine, the IC Mag thread was coming up, which is why they made us rename it. So we weren't allowed to type Girl Scout cookies anymore. We had to type GSC. And at that point um, is when people started calling it the forum cut. And it started because people outside the board and people amongst the board started getting it. And it really just spread like wildfire. I mean, then I think Animal came. Animal wasn't a thing at that time. And, you know, our buddy Straight Flame, he would have some insight into this. But in my circle with, with these guys, Animal didn't exist. There was just cookies. Um, and as far as we knew... That was it. I didn't, there was, there was the word thin mint, the word platinum, none of that had ever been uttered. There was no, there was no differentiation. It was just cookies. Um, and I think at that time is when like it started to kind of gain popularity. And part of it, I think part of the reason why I think it did gain the popularity is because it got out so much. I think if it hadn't got out, nobody would ever really seen it. It, you know, it would have been, it would have been some of the nicest herb nobody ever got to try. And to be honest, like the packs that they were growing were not very good. Like the Asian packs and the packs from the guys in the city were not really the greatest examples of cookies. I think it really took it getting into the hands of some people who actually cared about cultivating better flour. 
And once once people really put a lot of intent into it, they saw like, wow, you know, this is some really this is some really high grade flour. It's beautiful, you know, stunning, totally different than anything we were growing at the time. And uh, some of the first cookie packs to get to the green door came out of my garden. And I remember going in there one day after I'd been vending cookie packs to them for a while and seeing like they had like platinum cookies. And I said, what's what's platinum cookies? And they said, oh, that's that's your cookies. We just we just renamed it because there's other cookie packs now coming that aren't as good. So they started putting like regular cookies there and then platinum cookies. And then from there came like Thin Mint and this and that. And I think the cookie guys even came out and said that it wasn't real cookies. But if you ask around now, like globally speaking, if people know cookies, it's it's that cut. Um, whatever, whatever, you know, people, people, I think it's kind of one of those things where people might have forum and they might say, oh, it's Thin Mint or it might be this or it might be that. I know that there was a different group in LA that I've spoken with, um, some friends of my friends down there that had a cookie cut around the same time. And so around that like 09, 010 kind of area or yeah, basically right around there is when people started popping up with some of these other ones, but there really wasn't any differentiation at all. And animal became a thing. I mean, I saw the animal from my buddy Frostboss. That's who I got the cut from. And we ran them side by side. They were a little bit different. But I honestly think that I think there was just a bunch of S1s of whatever, like whatever or, or a bunch of fem seeds that that forum probably came from and that all the cookies probably came from. Because if you've noticed, there's never been a cookie mail ever, ever like and if you would think if you had the most pop, one of the most popular strains in the last 20 years, you would be capitalizing on that by, by breeding with the male. But it doesn't exist that I've ever seen. And it's been a long time since, since that plant's been out. So that's, you know, I think that's probably the majority of the story besides the fact, you know, that there was all kinds of, all kinds of crazy things going on with that cut. I mean, there was... It got to the point where it was it was just everywhere. And that honestly, like I've never really said anything about it, but that's something that kind of sat with me a little bit poorly was that people started using the term like whoring it out. And I didn't like that because I felt like it was disrespectful. I mean, it's something that we put out for free. I put it out for free. You know, we paid for it and we put it out for free. And so for people to kind of like treat it like that kind of left a salty taste in my mouth. I think it's why I really haven't been a proponent of passing out a lot of cuts. I'm very, very selective now about where and who I pass cuts to. Um, and I, I learned a lot from that because I think also you started seeing a lot of poor examples of the flower. And that, that goes down to one of my, one of my, uh, one of my favorite hashtags that I don't use that much. But it, it's basically stop, stop giving shitty growers good cuts because they make it look bad. Somebody sees an example of it and then says, oh, well, you know, I've had cookies and it's not that good. No, you just had a shitty example of it. It's it's proper herb. Like grown right, it's beautiful flower. And it's look at the staying power. I mean, it's been <clears throat> it's the most significant variety since OG. And I challenge anyone to point out another variety. It's not perps either. I mean, I love the perps and it was big in the Bay Area, but it never went national, it never went global. Like it's a Bay Area thing. You know, nobody in New York was asking for perps. Like yeah. people did want cookies. No, that's that's a really good recount. So I think the first thing I'd want to follow up with is I'd always assumed that the forum cut was just like an S1 of Thin Mint. Do you feel that that's maybe not the case? Or what do you think was the original Girl Scout cut that the Cookie Fam had? Yeah, so I don't, I don't think so. I think that if anything... Probably in those like they had they had and so Frost Boss, um, I've spoken to him a little bit about it. There there were some seeded packs back back then. Um, and he even he worked like deseeding some of these packs. And we think that that's where the Girl Scout cookies like seeds came from. Um, because I think what happened was that there was I I've always said I could be wrong. And this is one of those things where I'd love to see. I'd love to see it if, if I'm wrong or if I'm not. But at the time, you know, the the OGs and the cherry pie were like what was really, really popular in the Bay. And a lot of people had those in their gardens. And everybody knows that the cherry pie is unstable. And whenever I've looked at the cookies, that's what I see. I see cherry pie and OG. Like I see it, I see it in the structure. I see it in the color. I see it in the flavor. I see it in the profile. Like all of the above. Like that's, that's what I've seen. Um, to me, I think that... There was, you know, an accidental pollination 
and they grew some of the seeds out and that's probably where their cookie cut came from. I imagine that the forum cut came out of that same pack of seeds, let's say as it were out of those same packs and that they just grew it themselves independently. And that's where we got that cut from. I could be wrong, but like I said, there were, the word thin mint had never got uttered. Like that word did not exist. Like that, that, like that description of a specific cutting was not a thing. Like my buddy Frost Boss never said, "Oh, there's this thin mint or there's this platinum." It was just cookies. And after cookies came like animal, and that was it. Like it was cookies and then animal. And then I started hearing people talk about thin mint and all this other stuff. I think that may have been a reaction on their part to try and say, hey, we have something that's not what everyone else has. It's not the cut that's going around. We have thin mint cookies and that's the cookie fam version of it. But I could be wrong. You know, I would love to hear their perspective on it if that's the case. Like, you know, one of the things that, that does crack me up is when they talk about the breeding. Because if you bred it, where's the male? Like, and even if not, what did you reverse to make it happen? They keep talking about, oh, it's this and F1 Derb and blah, blah, blah. It's like, I was in the Bay. There were, people can say whatever they want to say. And I'd love to have my buddy Straight Flame clarify some points and he might. Um, I'd never seen it, you know, and we've seen a lot of flower and just the Bay area is very, very tight. Like in terms of like what's happening and who's growing what, like, People know what's going around. Like we, we eat, sleep, and breathe it. And so if there was such a thing, we would have heard about it. It's not a thing. Like, and if you, like I said, if there was this F1 derb and you used it to make this, you know, generational flower, why not use it again? Yeah. Like where, really where is it at? So with all that being said about the Girl Scout cookies, do you tend to try to avoid working with the forum cut now because it is so widespread and used or is it just something you're not particularly interested in working with or do you have plans for it in the future? How do you see the whole situation? Yeah, so I've actually, have I bred with it? Yeah, you know, I actually hit it once and I only made a few seeds with it. I did a forum with the, with the Sherb, um, but I've never actually, grow, I haven't grown them out yet. Uh, I mean, I think initially when we first got it, like I just, I had such respect for people breeding that I just didn't really feel like that was like the thing to do was just to like run on it and just cash in on it and whatnot. So just avoided it. And now I think generally, um, I think I'm just more interested in other types of work. There's so much work that's similar to it now, whether it's the do si and whatnot, that I just don't really see what I would do with it. Um, if anything for me, you know, as a plant in of itself, I appreciate it for breeding purposes. It's not really the direction that I'm looking to go in. One of the things that really surprised me about it was, you know, we'd, we'd all been told and kind of the common thought was that, Oh, it's a crazy poly hybrid and whatnot. So, you know, you're not, it's not going to be stable. You're not going to find anything good in it. It's actually incredibly dominant in a lot of the crosses. Like it really, really comes out in the crosses, um, similar to kind of how the dosido does. The cookie, the cookies tend to really, really shine through in a lot of these crosses. So for me, it's it's not that I'm avoiding it. I've actually thought about doing a fem project with the forum. I thought it might be fun. There's just a lot of other stuff on the plate that's kind of like looking forward that I think are more valuable, you know, in terms of in terms of what I'm trying to do with my time. So I, as much as I love it, I think I would include it in some projects, but not necessarily right now as like the focus of what I'm trying to do. Um, I could see it being a part of something, but not being like the main piece in everything. Yeah. Okay. And so how do you feel about cookies in general? Not just the various cuttings, but like the brand and where they're trying to take the whole image of it all. I mean, it's cool. You know, I see them. I mean, there was clearly a split between, I think, like the like like Sherbinsky and all those guys, even amongst themselves and then Burner with the cookies brand, because I think that's just Burner, that cookies brand. And um, it's interesting what they've done. You know, they've definitely capitalized on it. I have nothing but respect for being able to go out there and get a piece of something for themselves in terms of like what it actually is like. I don't have a lot of interest in it in the in and of itself. Me um, definitely can't knock the hustle, though. I see them out there, you know, between Burner with the stores or Sherbinsky doing his thing. 
some of the other guys, they don't seem as active. Um, I think Pi Guy and Jigga maybe is a little bit more active. But I have no knock on it. Um, I've Some of the work that I've seen hasn't been great. So I just kind of like not really excited about it. I mean, I'm sure you saw some of the work at Emerald Cup. Like there was definitely a lot of people there that had work that was more impressive to me. But as a brand, I mean, there's no denying it. They've they've crushed it. You know, it's a huge brand, it's globally recognized at this point. And, you know, whichever one of them, you know, whatever piece you're looking at, they've definitely done something with it that I think a lot of people, whether they want to admit it or not, a lot of people would have liked to be able to do. They just weren't able to tie all the pieces together. Yeah, so of they, course. They, they had something. Yeah, and they capitalized on it. They've certainly done some things well for sure, but let's talk about what they could have done better. What do you think are some of the things they've fallen short on? I honestly think that if they had all stayed working together um, and not maybe, and you know, I wasn't there, so I don't know, but usually in this business, there's a lot of ego. Um, people are used to being what I call king of their own castles. You know, they've all had their own warehouses. They've all had their own spots. They're all used to being their own bosses. A lot of them have never worked for anybody else or even really worked with anybody else in any kind of significant capacity. It's why so many of these relationships fall apart in this business. People don't know how to communicate and set clear expectations. They're not professional. I honestly think that there's companies on their way to, to billion dollar valuations right now. And if they had all figured out a way to work together, they would be on their way to doing that. And, you know, I can't knock anyone. I would have loved, I would love to see anybody from the underground make it to a billion dollar valuation one day. And if anybody could have done it, it would have been them. I think that's probably the biggest thing because it kind of seems like Berner just ran with it and he was really like the least influential person. I mean, he was working at the hemp center as like a security guard, if I remember correctly. And, um, kind of just like made the rap thing work and promoted it and, you know, hustled, hustled, hustled and definitely did a lot. I'm sure no knock to be clear, no knock on his hustle. I'm sure he busted his ass to get where he is right now because a lot of people were in the day at that time. A lot of people had the opportunity, but I, like I said, I think the biggest thing is, I mean, there's been, you know, fallouts between those people. And so I think that's probably the biggest thing that kind of set them, set them back and kept them from fulfilling their potential. I think if they'd all been able to just work together, they would have really achieved something special. Yeah, definitely. So, something I have been interested in myself and I can't really find a good answer is, was Shabinsky a part of the original crew? It always felt to me like he came in after they found the Girl Scouts and then had his little moment in there. What's your take on all that? Where does he fit in the picture for you? Yeah, I think, I mean, I'm pretty sure they were all friends because I think it's Pie Guy, Jigga, and Sherb. And I think, I think they were all friends, you know, in SF especially. It's like, it's kind of a like loose knit, but very, very affiliated city. Like people, there's a lot of people that have grown up out there. They know each other, you know, they're friends with friends or, you know, they dated each other's cousins or whatever it might be. Like people, people have deep, deep roots in that city. And it's a very, very small area. And so, you know, whether he, whether I don't, I don't, I doubt there was even really an official, you know, there was an official anything. I think they all just knew each other um, and happened to be involved in some of this stuff. And they probably all played their part in it. Um, from my understanding, you know, it was the three of them. It was Pi Guy, Sherbinsky, and Jiga that like were responsible for that. Yeah. And from there, you know, the affiliation with Burner, who was like rapping at the time, and, you know, did a lot of the promoting. And it's weird because pe people will shout out Burner as like, oh, yeah, thanks thanks to Burner for the cookies or whatever. And it's like, mm, not really. If you want to thank anyone, it's probably one of those three guys. And if really, if you want to thank someone, you could thank us because they didn't want that cut getting out. They didn't want people growing it. So if people are growing it, you could probably really thank us. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree on that point. And that raises an interesting point in itself. What do you think about Snowman, the, the last remaining cookie cut that they feel hasn't gotten out yet, that they're still keeping under lock and key? Yeah, so I've actually never seen it. And I would love to see it. Um, I think it's probably something that I'd have to ask my, my buddy Straight Flame about. I think he, he would definitely know more about it. And my buddy Frost Boss would know more about it. I've never seen it. You know, I've heard things about it. Um, but to be honest, I, I'd be curious to know, like, is it better than the Sherb? Is it better than any of the gelatos? Like, is it better than the cookies? Because 
a lot of that stuff is kind of treading in the same gene pool. So, you know, I just kind of feel like they're just on opposite ends of the cookie spectrum. I would love, I mean, if it's like a gassier version of the cookies, that might be interesting. Yeah. So, sorry, I was just going to say, I spoke to Shah of 707 Seed Bank and he's got an S1 of it because he managed to buy a bag off one of the guys, found a seed in it and uh, it's a pretty good S1. And he said it's just like a much more OG dominant version of cookies, basically. That's what I figured. That's the only other thing that it could be. And I remember, yeah, that I was going to say that I thought there was an S1 somewhere, but not i had never seen it so yeah that, i mean that doesn't surprise me i think if you wanted to do that though you know you could just reverse an og to the cookies and you would have that i don't think that it's anything you know i don't know i just i don't i don't know if it's game changing i mean does he sound very very excited about that s1 or is it just something that he's like it's good but it's neither here nor there he likes it for sure but i think that kind of touches on the point you raised earlier in that, you know, at, at that point, is it really that different from do si do Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's, that's exactly my point. Like, is, is it really anything? So, like, if you had a male, if you actually bred the cookies, hit it to something like a Vietnam, hit it to something like a Burma, hit it to something like a Guatemalan, hit it to something weird. Now, now we've got something. You know, like if you hit it to three different types of, you know, totally different genetics and run through those, I think that's how you're going to find something different. I mean, if cookies is kind of what I think it is, which is just OGs and cherry pie, um, what are you really doing that's that different? Like, yeah, you know, what's I mean, what do you what do you really have if you're if you're just hitting it back to an OG? Like, and so, so my next question on the cookies would be. I think you might have a little bit of an idea, but if you don't, that's fine. Do you know much about the story behind the OGKB? Because what you find online is just that supposedly the guy, OG Kush Breath, just is like, oh, I just got given it as GSC. But like, I feel like there's probably a bit more to it than that. Yeah, so he's, as far as I know, I don't think uh, OG Kush Breath has ever really spoken publicly about it. Um, so I definitely wouldn't want to put words in his mouth. I know NorCal who is friends with him and, you know, I know as much as NorCal has told me and the story of where it came from, I can't speak to it. I do know how, how it got out. I do know how it was given out, but where he got it from, I can't say. And I, I think that he got it as a cutting. I don't think he popped it from seed. So I believe that he got that as as a cutting, and it may have been from from that initial batch that I think most of these seeds came from. Yeah, because they're very similar. You know what what people call the thin mint and the animal, and even the OGKB, even though the structure is completely mutated and totally, you know, in that way it's different. The the bag appeal, the frost, the like the the flavor profile is very very similar. The style of the flower, very very similar. Um, I mean, all, all I know about that is that it was given to NorCal as a favor, um, as a thank you for a favor that he did for OG Kush Breath. And, you know, if he wants to speak publicly about, about what that was at some point, he can. But um, I'll say that he did a favor for him. And as a thank you, um, he gave him that plant. He, uh, NorCal gave that plant to several of us, um, probably a half dozen of us. Nobody kept it. I kept it. Nobody else kept it because when we put it in the bedrooms, it got lapped by everything else. When we sent it into flower, it literally got drowned out. I remember having to like lift it up to get it to like above the canopy where the sours were and everything else. I mean, it couldn't keep huh. up with form. It couldn't, it couldn't keep up with anything. It vegged super slow. It didn't like to be overwatered. It was slow to root. Nobody liked it. Um, everyone let it go. And it wasn't until probably about nine months or a year later when it started kind of getting some traction that people started hitting us up asking for it back. And NorCal's general response was, well, I already gave it to you once. No, I'm not, I'm not giving it to you again. So a lot of people didn't get it back. And I think, you know, a couple people got it and it, it is out. You know, some people have it. But if you notice, it's not one that people produce large amounts of flour of. It's not one that, you know, that you see commonly on a shelf. And I have seen certain producers in other states claim to have it. And when I've seen the flower in the store, it's it's not the OGKB. Um, it's, it's just not. So I've never actually seen it like commercially on a shelf. 
probably because of how difficult it is to grow and how long it takes. But, you know, what's interesting is when you see it crossed with the, with, with the uh, face-off um, in the dosi do it doesn't show that. I mean, it shows some of the mutant tendencies, and you see that in, like, the peanut butter breaths and whatnot because it comes out a lot in there. But there's generally good plants to be found in there. So it's a weird plant. It's hard to pollinate. I actually made an OGKB SFVNL at one point that I've never run those seeds. Um, it didn't make a lot of them. It doesn't have a lot of pistols. And this is a friendly piece of advice if anybody does have it and is interested in pollinating it. Um, you're going to want to pollinate it way early. And it just does not have a lot of pistols. So it will not make a lot of seeds. It just it can't. Um, and you're gonna wanna you're gonna wanna adjust your feed. You're gonna wanna adjust your lighting and whatnot to make it stretch a little bit more and make it a little bit less dense, so the seeds have more time to fill in. And um, yeah, it's a it's a really interesting plant. Um, hard pressed to find an ounce of it, honestly. Like only I, I'm really the only person I know still growing it is NorCal, and he, mostly for personal projects and whatnot, things that he's working on for himself but not really for commercial production at all. Like, I've, like I said, I've never seen it. I've seen it once on the shelf and it wasn't what they said it was. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've certainly never been able to try it, unfortunately. Um, I would love to take a stab because I think I read somewhere, I think NorCal wrote somewhere the reason how he got that plant. And maybe you can yay, nay that for me or if you prefer not to, that's fine. But what I had heard was that uh, OG Kush Breath had like a grow somewhere and he was like about to be busted by the cops or something and like NorCal went to the grow and like took it all down for him and was like as he's doing it like the cops could bust in at any moment type thing so very much in danger himself but he managed to do it and get it all packed up and so it was given to him as like a thank you for that because that's obviously like a pretty hectic situation is that roughly what happened that is yeah that is exactly what happened um, yeah, it was a favor for breaking down a spot. And like you said, you know, anything could have happened at that time. Um, he was at risk of getting busted there. And so as a favor, as a thank you for doing that for him, he gave him that cut. And that's, you know, I know they've always had, they've always had a good relationship over the years, the two of them. So, you know, solid. I mean, NorCal is one of the most, I'll put it on record. NorCal is one of the most solid guys you'll ever meet in this business. We've been friends for a long time long time and very very stand-up guy good good person yeah good to know good to know okay so my final question directly relating to cookies for the moment is do you think that there will be any repercussions on the cookie fam for the whole candy rain debacle or do you think they're just going to slip by and nothing will ever really happen about it I think they're going to slip by and they're going to pop back up again and they're going to do something again and people are going to forget that this ever happened. I mean, you got to remember there's other people not at their scale and not at that price point that have kind of had these issues and I'm I'm not going to I don't want to say anybody's name or whatever if if you know if you've been in this you've seen there's a couple of individuals specifically that have popped up, dropped a whole line, had it be a disaster, gone underground and popped up a couple years later and tried again. Um, but the candy rain debacle, I mean, honestly, people are such fanboys that I don't even think they're mad. If anything, they, they kind of set the standard for, Hey, you know, if you find one, that's good enough. And I mean, those packs, you know, they were a significant amount of money. People lost a lot of time and energy into those. And clearly, you know, there was massive issues with them. And so I think, I think people were just doubly upset. And the fact that I don't really think they ever responded to it publicly, I think they kind of just ignored it, as far as I know. I think a big part of the candy rain debacle was, yeah, people spent a lot of money and they couldn't even get them to germ. Um, But they don't want to say anything. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, a little bit of an insider scoop, which may or may not be publicly known, but um, JBZ has 100% signed on to be Cookie Fam's in-house breeder from now on. So we will certainly see some more stuff from them in the near future. Yeah, no, I had heard about that. Um, yeah, no, congratulations to him. I'm, I hope they cut him a huge check, honestly. Right. Yeah. So, I'm like I said, I'm not mad at anyone getting out there getting it, you know, like, good for them. If you can get them to cut you a huge check, I think it's easy for a lot of people to say, oh, I would never do that until it's sitting in front of you. And then would you do that? Yeah. Um, I was going to just say, there's a lot of people making making the transition into the recreational cannabis market doing just that. Because they don't have the capital, they don't have the access to the property, they don't have the connections. 
So they're going to they're gonna sign on with someone who can who can take what they've built and magnify it. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And if and you know, based on JBZ's work, like you know, for the most part, he does pretty good stuff. You know, hopefully that trend continues in terms of what he does for Cookie Fam. Yeah, I don't see any reason why it wouldn't. I think I think honestly, I think it's I think it's going to be good work. Yeah, hopefully. Okay, well, to get off something a little less doom and gloom, I did want to quickly run this by you. How do you feel when you see like kind of, I don't want to say distant offspring, but just kind of offspring of the forum go on to reach stardom? Like the one that comes to mind is if you trace it back, the GMO has got the forum in it. When you see that type of thing and all the traction it gets, do you get a certain sense of kind of accomplishment from that or do you just don't really think about it? To be honest, I, I don't really think about it much, but but I always felt like cannabis had done so much for me that there was really nothing that I could ever do to repay it. And I'm going to be blunt and say something that people don't really seem to say. Like, I don't believe in the cannabis community. I grew up where, you know, people sold drugs. I grew up where people hustled. Like, that's why I've always, re- like, responded well to, like, Oakland and the type of mentality that people have there. It's a hustling mentality. It doesn't matter what they're doing. They're, they're, trying, they're trying to hustle, survive, and improve their position. Um, and so cannabis had always done so, so much for me. I didn't ever really think there was anything I could ever do to like to repay it in general. Like the I don't want to say the community because I don't really believe in that, but more more just so like just the world that, that it cultivates around it, the people that are in the space, the people that are in like tied into this plant and all the different offshoots of it. Um, and so to see the forum cut get used in so many projects and just real and like, yeah, and like you said, to see the GMO um, blow up and a bunch of these other cuts that have blown up because of it as well. If anything, like, I'd say it makes me a little bit happy because I feel like I had the chance to contribute to like changing the course of cannabis, which how many people can really say that? How many people can really say that without this thing that they had done that that they played a part, you know, in in literally shifting the course of cannabis on a global scale? And, you know, with like you said, without that cut, making it to Europe um, and Mamiko making those seeds and then, you know, Skunk Master Flex selecting that cut and, you know, it blowing up in Michigan before it ever blew up out here. That was one of the first cuts that actually, you know, in a long time that actually started in the, in the Midwest and came west a couple years later. It wasn't, you know, it was big there before it was really big out west. So in a way, I would say, you know, that it stokes me because to know that that would not exist if we had not done what we did, even as far as getting the cut to Europe. Like if we hadn't done that, Mamiko would have never made the GMO. And if he hadn't made the GMO, then Skunk Master Flex, you know, they wouldn't have the, the Han Solo burger and all, all that other stuff that, that they've done with that. So when you really look at it, I mean, a lot of stuff when you trace it back is from the forum. I mean, even Sin City Seeds, you know, um, I want to say, if I'm not mistaken, I want to say it was like uh, Blue Power and Forum and they use that uh, i think jbz used that when they made the wedding cake and yes, yes definitely. definitely yeah so that also would not exist without that i mean there's a lot of if when you really really trace it back it's kind it's kind of like a horse or something where you say look at all these look at all the offspring and all the all the all the different plants that are related to it that can be traced back to it that wouldn't exist without it i mean To me, it kind of stokes me because really, like, how many people have actually had a chance to contribute to the cannabis scene at that level? I mean, you can talk about Chemdog, you can talk about a couple of these people, you know, that, I mean, they were pivotal factors in in these plants, you know, getting to where they were going. You know, Bubba, um, I mean, the Chems, the Bubbas, even the Sours, you know, all of that stuff. And I mean, with the OGs, you know, you can talk about Ghost, Um, you know, the Ghost Cut. And um, some of that stuff at L.A., I mean, if that stuff hadn't really gone where it got, you know, like a lot of the stuff from, you know, in, from uh, Archive wouldn't exist. I mean, Face Off and all that stuff from, you know, from those guys down in SoCal and then, you know, the doctor working with that. And just it's in it's I would say more than anything, I'm grateful to have had the chance to play a part in in this thing. And I think the biggest takeaway is like, 
you are just a piece of this whole thing. It's not nobody in this business and in this scene or whatever you want to call it exists independently of everybody else. We're all connected to each other in some way, shape or form. And some of us, you know, have bigger, you know, roles that we've played more, more has gone through us than other people, more connections, more networks, whatever it might be, have spiraled out from these things that we've done. But without, you know, all these people, it wouldn't exist. I mean, if I had just given the cut to my, if I just given the cut to my two or three friends and they hadn't passed it out, I wasn't going to pass it out, not because I had no interest in passing it, just because I, or because I was against passing it, just because I just generally avoided talking to people. Like in this business, no good comes from talking to people. So just the more that you avoid people, the longer you'll survive. And that was kind of my feeling on that. So if anything, I would say that I'm honored, you know, it's funny that the GMO is actually one of the only cuts I ever asked for. And they told me, they said yes, but they never got it to me. And they kind of just like left me on, okay, whatever. Um, so I thought that was kind of funny because yeah, that cut wouldn't exist without, without the work that I had done. I mean, I know true, um, in the UK and in Spain has worked a lot with the forum as well. He got that, you know, directly from our circle I mean, a lot of people can trace where that cut came from back to people that were affiliated with us. So, yeah, I would say if anything, you know, I'm grateful and I'm honored, you know, to have been able to shift cannabis in some way, shape or form to have even been a part of it. Yeah, what a really awesome sentiment to express. And that's so kind of coincidental. You you referenced True. I'm interviewing him in like 12 hours. So there you go. Random. Um, nice. He's a cool guy, I guess. You vouch for him? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he knows me from the forums from back in the day. Um, he was affiliated with some of our friends, and that's how he got that forum cut, which I'm sure you can ask him about. Cool. You just gave me another question. I love it. But something you did mention, which I, you know, a fan favorite of the show, personal favorite of mine, Chemdog. Let's talk about it. The 91, the various Ds. What are your experiences with the Chemdog? Do you like it? Which one's your favorite? Give me the lowdown. So I love the Chem D. Um, the first Chem I ever grew was the four. And it was, you know, bigger yielding, you know, real solid, threw down really, really well. But people kind of had got tired of it. That's actually one that I'm like bummed that I that I gave up. I know some friends of ours in our circle still have it, so I could I could get that one back at some point. But for whatever reason, it's been like like the least favorited one out of all of them. Um, the D is phenomenal, and you know you talked about the GMO, and that's really part of what makes it special. I mean, the proper D well done is you know what what my what my boy calls blunt weed or gangster weed it's like it's super potent incredibly tasty does not does not have the best bag appeal in the entire world does not photograph super well um but is just amazing phenomenal herb just raunchy beautiful herb i mean it's what makes the gmo like you know the gmo just got dressed up in a better in a better bag necessarily or a better shell from the forum but really, what really makes it is the Chem D. And then the 91 is a beautiful plant. The 91 and the D are gorgeous plants in and of themselves. The 91 being more OG, um, which I just I just love it. I mean, I think it's an amazing, amazing plant as well. And, you know, but they're, they're a little bit fickle. The, the, D, the D will do better. The 91 is a little bit more fickle. Um, but I love them both. I think that they're, you know, they're, they're staples in, in the cannabis scene, in my opinion. And I don't think that enough people have actually seen, like you said, oh, the various Ds. And yeah, there's the non-variegated and this one and the other one. Um, we were lucky enough to get the D cut from JJ separately. You know, we had had it as well. Um, but, you know, when we when we got the one from JJ, we said, OK, well, you know, this one is definitely the one. If, if there was any question, there's not a question anymore. And uh yeah, it's a phenomenal plant. Beautiful. Love it. I mean, if you I mean, you've tried the GMO, I'm sure you've tried the D. The 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 way that the profile sticks to your palate, you know, it's really it kind of like cuts through anything else. Yeah, very very special plant. And this kind of like a nice little segue onto the next question, which is let's talk about a strain that I think will become known as like the equivalent of the Chem Dogs, but for kind of the 2010 to 2020 period the Mac, you know, it's been so used, abused, you know, all the rest of it. 
What's your thoughts on it and do you plan to work with it? Because it's something I noticed is surprisingly missing from your feed. Yeah, so I got the Mac um, initially, like when, when, when people started kind of getting it. I was pretty excited about it. I was like, okay, this you know, I've heard good things. It looks good. Um, I grew it and I just wasn't impressed with it. And I passed it to a couple of friends of mine, you know, people who've been, you know, people who I have in my circle and I've shared cuts with for a long time. And we mostly all agreed, except for one of us, we mostly all agreed that it's not that great. Um, it looks good. It has nice bag appeal, does not really have much else going for it. In my opinion, um, I don't really care for the flavor. I don't care for the high. I don't care for the growth habit. Um, I don't like it. I mean, I think Cap did a great job marketing and promoting and branding it. I think he did a, I think he did a phenomenal job by saying, don't give this to people who haven't earned it. And in that way, he kind of made it special. Um, I have seen a lot of the crosses from it. And so to answer your question, um, I have seen a lot of the crosses from it. And they come out very, very like what I would describe as that Jack Lemony profile. I think it's from the Colombian in it. And that's not really something that I necessarily need to look for um, or would want to look for. And it seems very, very dominant in a lot of the crosses. So for me, not really something that I intend to work with. Um, I did make, I think I made some Mac Sherb seeds, but I have not popped them. And um, I don't really think I have any intention to pop them. At some point, I guess if one of my friends wanted them, I'd probably let them run it. But from what I've seen, it's not really a direction that I want to go down. So I actually have a pack of the Mac that I bought, you know, in all honesty, from the first drop. Um, but it's one that, you know, I don't think it's going to stand up. I think it's, you know, going to disappear pretty quickly. I mean, and if you've noticed, like, there's not really a lot of hype left around it right now. Although it's crazy at the events, when, when Cap is there, the line is like 100 people deep or 200 people deep for it. So all the crosses and this, that, and the other. So I'll be interested to see, you know, one of my friends does love it. I mean, he, he told me that I'm wrong flat out. He said, it's, he said he likes it. Um, but for me, it's, no, I've got no interest in it. And it's mostly just everything that I described about how it breeds and the effect and the high and the taste, all of the above. Beautiful plant, though. Photographs extremely well, like a great Instagram plant, if you ask me. Yeah, I would agree with that. And the thing about the Mac, which I mean, it has been said before, but I'll bring it up again, is it frustrates me how no one's talking about the fact that no other serious, legitimate contender keeper cuts have ever been found from the seeds. It's like, it's almost mm -hmm. like the Mac 1 exactly. was pulled out of the aether and then the seeds that are produced are almost different because there's, yeah, no one has ever found a keeper, especially a male. No. Nothing that I have seen come out of those out of the crosses that have been like, you know, the the authorized kind of crosses that he's done, as well as some of the work that other people have done, nothing has ever made any waves in anybody's garden. And so I think that there's a lot of there was a lot of hype around it, but just kind of looking at what's come from it, it makes me think that it's not really a it's not really a direction I would ever want to go in. Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to work it. I wouldn't want to sell it to people. I, I just, I have no interest in going down that road. I'll be interested to see if he keeps working with it. You know, I don't know if he's onto something else. Perhaps he is. Um, but yeah, not like you said, nothing has really come from those seeds. And you would think, like, I mean, you know, that can't. The same cannot be said for Jay Beasy's work. Like, there's been a ton of work that that people have found. There's been a ton of crosses, the ice cream cake, whatever, all this stuff that has come out since you know since the wedding cake stuff. That people are, you know, people are like, yeah, man, this is really nice work. I mean, we have a wedding cake sherb that I made that's phenomenal. I mean, it's beautiful, it's gorgeous. Like, uh, you know, it was hard to pick a keeper out of those out of those wedding cake sherb seeds that we made and ran. Like, there was a bunch of them that were just beautiful. And I think that if I did the same thing with the Mac, I think I probably would have killed them all. So <laughs> let's let's jump back to those sunset sherb crosses for a minute. When you test those crosses, do you find that the sherb tends to be quite dominating, or it more lets the other parent shine through? So that's so one of the things that I've done, which some of my friends have disagreed with, is I tend to make a lot of crosses sometimes, and even if I don't release them or post them or whatever it might be. I I like to do it. And the, the reason is because I've noticed that 
Um, when something, so somebody might say, oh, the sherb is dominant. And that may be the case, but there are pairings where it, where it is not. And I don't think that things are universally dominant. So I don't think that if you reverse a sherb, let's say, and hit, you know, 20 different clones, that there, that the sherb is always going to be dominant. There's ones where it shines out and there's ones where, where it kind of fades back. And I've noticed that in some different crosses. We did a Dago Walker to the U-Dub and then we did the sherb to the U-Dub and the Dago Walker to the U-Dub uh, the Dago was dominant and we did the Sherb to the U-Dub and the U-Dub was dominant. Um, and so, you know, they both had the same U-Dub cut. They had different donor parents as it were, and both of them responded differently to it. So, you know, with the Sherb crosses, I mean, what we see in like the wedding cake Sherbs is that there are some that are wedding cake, there are some that are Sherb and there are some that are 50, 50. And I'd probably put them at about, you know, 40% one way, 40% the other, and 20% down the middle. And the 50-50 ones are the ones that I'm always most interested in. The ones that are more wedding cake or more sure, why would I select that way if I already have those cuttings? So it just makes sense to me to try and find something where it pairs well. Um, in the case of the UW Dago, we did select towards the Dago only because that grapefruit profile is something I really like. And it just was kind of a finicky, less like lower yielding plant, whereas the UW just throws down these, you know, big fat resinous colas on it. Um, and it's just, you know, it's hardy and chunky and, you know, veggies well. And so selecting one like that with that grapefruit profile, you know, was a real, real improvement for us. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, heck, speaking of sherbet and grapefruit, this seems like a really good time to ask. In the past, we had heard stories that it was possible that the Skittles cut was just a sherbet S1. Now, given your experience with sherbet, do you think there's any possibility that could be true? Um, I mean... No, I don't think so. And and the reason is because we have, you know, run a lot of Sherb and we've run a lot of Sherb crosses. And I don't think that the Skittles came from that. Um, I haven't really, God, I, I can't say that I really thought much ever about, about where the Skittles actually came from. Um, I mean, it was such a weird, wonky plant that I never really had a lot of interest in it. And I know it made a lot of waves as well and people were really interested in it. But it kind of reminds me of the lemon tree in a way where it's like this is not something that like is like game changing. This is something that's interesting, but a flavor that I would be soon bored of if that's all I was if that's all I was consuming. Um, whereas with like a sour or a camera and OG, you know, that's something that, you know, I could take those all day and be completely satisfied. Um, beautiful, beautiful herb. I kind of put the Skittles where I put the lemon tree, which it's an interesting flavor, but I only want to see it as like 20% of a cross, as it were. I don't really want to see it as like the whole thing. But yeah, to answer, I don't think, I would not say that the Skittles was a sure best one. Yeah, it's I mean, yeah. if you've seen the flower, it's just it's ugly. It's like and it's not just that they grow it poorly. It's that it's not really super high grade herb in that way. It's very, very tasty, though, and amazing for extracts, much like the lemon tree. Yeah. And what I found interesting that you kind of brought that point about the lemon tree is I always find it very peculiar how similar the terpene profile is between sherbet and lemon tree even though one's obviously more orangey one's more kind of more lemony but i feel like there's this underlying similarity between the two between the lemon tree and the sherb uh sorry lemon tree and skittles yes um yeah <laughs> if you asked me if you said hey the Sk the the lemon tree was an s1 of the skittles or or the skittles was an s1 of the lemon tree which you know we all think is just some lemon uh you know lemon from basically the santa cruz area that had been there supposedly for years anyway um and that's not you know that's not an area i spent a lot of time in up up in that up in those mountains but my understanding is that that's all the lemon tree is it's just a rebranded lemon cut that was you know popular in that area for a long time anyway and if you told me the skittles was an s1 of the lemon tree that i would believe that would actually make a lot of sense to me but that's another one where like there's never been a male. There's no male Skittles like that I've yeah. ever seen. And you could correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think there's ever been like an actual male. They've crossed it with things and then they did like the ZOZ and some other stuff. Um, 
But I don't think there was ever an actual mail of Skittles. Yeah, I think you're correct on that one. Interesting. Yeah, I, I noticed that another kind of older strain from around those older days that I noticed on your feed was the Las Vegas Purple Kush. I'd love to know, how did you get it? Because you don't, you don't see a lot about it and people don't often speak about it, but there are some people who hang on to it. So, I figure it must have some value. What's your take on it? So, that cut, as we can trace that cut back pretty far within, within our personal circle. And um, the cut originally, so, so we attribute that, the cut, that cut to somebody named Hydra Sun who uh, passed away. Um, he was the one that brought that cut into our circle. He was definitely a character, as most of us tend to be. And he had sourced that cut from some people that he knew up in Washington, I believe. And originally, um, another friend of mine who is super underground, he was the one that actually got that cut for our friend Hydro Sun. And Hydro Sun brought that cut down to, uh, to Vegas and spread it to our circle out there. And from there, it spread, it spread to some of our guys in the Bay Area. I always avoided it because it grew like a Bubba, and I never liked Bubba at all. Um, I had no interest in Bubba. I didn't want to grow it. I didn't like the profile. Um, and the samples that I had seen of Bubba were kind of weak. It was kind of after the Bubba had been grown kind of well and it was kind of getting commercialized and whatnot. And so I, just the bad samples, I'd never really been impressed by it. Um, but that's a cut that I kept for a long, long time. It's a beautiful plant. It's hardy, vigorous, very, very resistant. Um, I think, I think inspector or, uh, I think the doctor has come out, um, and back and forth here and there and said that, oh, it's a Bubba S1 or something, or it's a weak version of Bubba. Um, and yeah, for me, I, I always thought it was a great plant. I know in our circle, it's always been very, very popular. It definitely spread from there, whether other people were able to get it through other avenues and maybe that's where they acquired it. I know there's some people in the Midwest we've spoken to that have held it and grown it for a while as well. Um, I know that our circle and Hydro Sun in particular were responsible for spreading that cut. It's like I said, it's not a cut that anyone's going to have any interest in today. Um, it, you know, it, it doesn't trim up well, does not have a ton of bag appeal. It grows very, very interesting, um, potent flower, but you know, who's to say, um, kind of anything beyond that. I just, I believe that it came out of a garden in Washington originally when we got it. And then we spread it down to, to Vegas. And I think that's where it took that name. Um, and then from there, it kind of spread out. But it is, it's a cut that's kind of, that's known, but it seems unknown in a way as well. I don't really know that that many people outside are like familiar with it. So, it's interesting that, that you bring it up. Yeah, because it's kind of one of those ones which does persist on, but doesn't get a lot of mention, does it? No, well, we've we've definitely kept it around. I mean, it has a place in our circle, and I think people, certain individuals, have an affinity for it. Um, one or two people in particular that I'm thinking about that I think there are just certain cups, certain cuts that they're going to keep probably forever, and that's one of those cuts. They just love it. I mean, grown grown right, you know, they've had good results with it. I think one of my friends grew it in deep water culture which spread, uh, sped up the veg and increased, um, the yield on it. So, you know, he has a special place for it in his garden always. And, um, yeah, it's, it's kind of cool to see it continue to survive and persist. I've definitely done some work with it. I've done an LVPK Sherb and a couple other little projects with it that I think, you know, a lot of that stuff, um, a lot of the seeds, they just go to friends of mine. So, and a lot of them, they're not on Instagram. They don't care about anything. They're just, they're just doing what they do and they just, they just want to grow, you know, we all, we've all just been sharing seeds for a long time. I mean, a lot of those sherb seeds, I never made them available. People didn't really have a chance to buy them. They mostly just went to friends of mine. Yeah, okay. Well, I mean, heck, speaking of seeds, I've noticed that you tend to make a good mix of both femme and regular seeds. Do you have one you prefer most? And do you feel like feminized seeds will eventually overtake regularity, uh, overtake regular seeds in popularity? So, yes. So, for years and years, you know, there was the common thought that like, oh, you know, fems are unstable, this, that, and the other, whatever it might be. Um, you know, that, that had kind of stuck in my mind for a while until we actually, until I started seeing people doing work with them. 
and then kind of seeing what was coming from it. And I started to understand a little bit more that like, not necessarily, you know, if, if the work, if it was done, you know, unintentionally or whatever it might be, then yes, you know, um, especially some like the sours and whatnot. But if you do it intentionally, I do feel like, so I've seen a lot of regular male, female work. And if you do a poor selection on the male, you are kind of dooming that whole line. Everything that comes after that is probably not going to be good. And really the only way to know is to use the mail, grow out the seeds, see, see what comes of it, and then determine, okay, this is a solid mail, and then probably go back and do another line with them. What I really appreciate about the fems, especially, you know, like the clone onlys or whatever it might be. Well, I guess that the term is kind of loose these days, but basically like selected cuts versus, you know, just a general mail or whatnot. If you take, if I take a sherb, which people know, and I cross it to, let's say, a Skittles, which people know, you're kind of taking the breeder out of the equation. At that point, what you're really depending on is, does this person actually have these cuts? And so for me, going forward, um, some of the work, you know, is going to be more, more focused on the fems. Because I think that people really, that's really what people want. I mean, a lot of people, they don't really want to breed. So if you don't want to breed, you don't want to do the sex testing, you don't want to have to identify anything, you have a limited amount of space, some people stick to plant counts or whatnot and where, wherever they are, they would rather just pop fems. They would rather say, okay, cool, this is, you know, gelato 25 cross with do do Perfect. Like this will work, you know. And, you know, gelato and sherb or, you know, wedding cake and sherb. You're, take, you're taking the breeder out of the equation. You're taking their personal kind of they, – they're not able to influence as much the process. So you're just saying, hey, basically, thanks for having the legitimate cut. Thank you for providing these seeds, and I hope they germinate. And then, you know, basically your service is done. Um, and that, that brings up a point, you know, for me as well, which I don't know if it's uh, something you were going to ask, but – a lot of what's going on out there right now, it's people not working with legitimate cuttings. And I think that's one of the reasons that I've been able to do what I do is because people know that if I say I have something, that it is that it is that. And that's something that I've earned over a long, long time in this business. I think when people pop up now and they've got no reputation, they've got no name, they're not – I'm not, honestly, I hold Inspecta in high regard – um, I was going to say, you know, like they're not inspector, they're, they're not these other people, not to put myself with him. Um, but if inspector says he has a cut, I a hundred percent believe it. So when he did those triangle cush ass ones and people were complaining about the price, I, my, I was dying laughing because the opportunity to get a triangle cush S one, which took him multiple attempts to achieve from inspector is invaluable. And if you can't see that, then, you know, it's not for you. Because, you know, that's that's a guy who if he says he has something, it is exactly what he says it is. And that's that's something that's like sorely lacking. I see people popping up right now and they're saying, oh, you know, I got the runts or I got this or I got that or, you know, something comes out and they already have a whole line with it and a whole reverse fem line to all these other ones. And it's like, who number one, who are you? F totally fine. Go ahead and get your money. But number two, like, just like, is it really is it really what you say it is? And, you know, I think, I think there's, there's a lot of that going on, but for me, yeah, I mean, I intend to keep doing some male, female work, but that work takes longer. And just like that, Azazel, people aren't really interested in, you know, people, people don't, people don't see the value of working something two or three or four generations. You're really kind of limiting yourself. And from that kind of perspective, people more want exactly what they know. So if you say, I've got a wedding cake and a sherb, they're very into that. But if you say, oh, I've got a Vietnam black tie with a grand doggy perp, cross with a grand doggy perp, banana limon, then you have to explain all that to them. You have to say, oh, the limon in, in cross was from swan song seeds, and it's a double sour diesel chitral, and you know it's crossed with a banana, but it's not the banana OG. It's a Sonoma cut that we had. It's like banana runs almost. And then you know we made that, and then the grand doggy perp is a chem D GDP from Connoisseur back in the day. And, you know, you got to explain all this stuff to them. And the Vietnam black tie is from Ace. And most people are going to be like, who's Ace? And what is that? And what is all of that? Like, where's the cookies at? That's what that's. <laughs> honestly, that's what they're going to say. So literally, if I just do cookies to cookies, 
people will buy that. You know, fortunately for me, like honestly, I'm I'm a little bit more difficult about selling my seeds. I don't really care if people buy them or don't buy them. And that's not to be disrespectful of anyone. That's just to say like I do what I do because I want to do it. And because I think it's going to be good. But when it comes down to actually selling seeds, why would you spend three or four years on a project when people are pumping out six projects a year of just fems to fems? You know, they, I mean, people are literally going to a dispensary and buying a Gelato 33 clone and reversing it to everything else. Or they're, they're popping one pack of seeds from somebody else and just hitting a bunch of stuff and just renaming it. Um, saying they have this, saying they have that. And I think a lot of that is kind of what's going on out there right now. But yeah, for me, I'm, I'm going to still do some fem work. Um, the fem work is tricky too, you know, and inspector, I've been grateful to take some time from him. Um, you know, it's not, they don't always work. I tried to do a high life reversal, barely worked, barely put out any seeds. Very, 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 um, frustrating. That when that happens and all you can really do is just go back to the drawing board and just try again you know and I, I know i know matt matt sells some solutions and uh one of my buddies uh chef Rowe from people under the stairs he's he has another solution that he makes and you know we're toying with some different things and some gibberellic acid and whatnot in the mix with the sts to see if you know we'll get the intended results that we need but you know generally it's not always the fems aren't always guaranteed either and so i understand you know like like that's why I feel like they can kind of command a higher premium because, and I think people don't understand that, like what it takes to back up so many plants, like the commitment that it takes to keep such a diverse library. It's, there's a lot of people that are just going to the dispensary, buying eight clones and you know, they start a seed company and that's great and that's fine and dandy. They don't even keep any of the cuts. They just go back and buy them again. They hope it's the same cut, you know, maybe they hope, maybe they don't care. Um, but to back up the sheer number of plants, you know, that I have backed up over the years and that people like inspect to back up, that's why I feel like they deserve a premium. That's why I feel like, you know, it's worth paying them what they ask because of what it takes to go into that. I mean, you're not just paying for, you know, somebody to make some seeds in a tent or something. It's like this person has dedicated years to sourcing, collecting, preserving, transporting, moving, you know, cloning, backing up, whatever it might be. And then tried to do these things for you. Um, but yeah, no, I'm always going to do some regular male female work and, and some femme work. I enjoy the femme work, honestly. A lot of people want that. They don't, they don't care about breeding. They have no interest in males. Like they just want to pop some seeds, grow some flowers, pick a female and go from there. Yeah, I agree with just almost everything you said, you know, like that, that trusting a breeder and not doing the the kind of the the shady acts that we see certain breeders like copycat genetics fuck you big dan i hate you um <laughs> yeah no, that guy's trash in every sense um but yeah you know and someone like inspector on the other hand you know the epitome of kind of what you can trust as the gold standard so yeah i totally agree and we're going to talk about some azazel stuff soon because i'm super interested in that like above all things but i want to quickly ask you do you feel like when you're converting a female to be like the pollen donor for a cross, do you feel like that causes any sort of stress? Like, do you feel like the result of you doing that is different from if the plant had hermed out or do you feel like they're essentially the same result? I feel, I feel that they're different. Um, in my experience, the plants that herm out, as it were, um, tend to produce more unstable seeds. And when you intentionally do it, it seems to actually produce more stable seeds. But, I mean, that could just be a matter of the plant that hermed out was initially more prone to that anyway. So, maybe, maybe, if, maybe it wouldn't have had anything to do anyway. Maybe if you had sprayed the plant that was going to herm out, it would do it anyway. Whereas the other one is just less prone to doing so. Um, I've never tried both ways, to be honest. Um, but in my experience, I think that if you do it intentionally versus if it happens accidentally, it's, I, I feel, I find it to be more, more reliable in my experience. Yeah, definitely. I can, I can back that myself with my limited experience making fems. And so the follow-up question is, have you ever done any kind of more weird breeding stuff with your regular things? And by that, I mean, like we often refer to how DJ short, had many moons ago referenced like that hermaphrodite males were, were good males to breed with. Do you ever do any kind of left of field stuff like that at all? Or you try to keep it pretty straightforward? 
No, I try and keep it pretty basic. It's 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 a very very complicated um, <laughs> game to play anyway, and to try and complicate it even further, I would leave that to someone like DJ or some of these other people out there. I mean, the kind of work that that DJ has done is not really the kind of work that I would want to do. Like I don't I don't the kind of breeding that he's done is different than what I'm interested in. For me, I'm most interested in taking like things that are popular now and combining them with things that are, you know, kind of out of left field that people wouldn't expect. Like, like I did a Burma with the GB six tricks and that's not something that anybody's doing. And in fact, when I made it uh, low key, um, was he even asked, he's like, nobody's going to want that. Nobody's going to care about Burma or Lucy or any of this weird stuff that you're doing. And I said, it's fine. People will, will grab whatever they want. They'll grab dosido face on fire. They'll grab this, they'll grab that. They'll grab the peanut butter breath, whatever it is they're interested in. It's totally fine. I do that because I like to do that. And that's, you know, I enjoy doing, that's probably about as weird as I get, is kind of combining some of these left field uh, cultivars with something that people would not expect it to be combined with. Of course. So when you are looking to select a male, what are the, some of the traits you find ideal in a male? Like, would you have any tips for the audience? They love this type of things. Like, is there any sort of visual cues or anything that you like to go with? Yeah. So the first thing is that I look for is structure. Um, I like a plant that has what I consider ideal structure. I don't want something that's too stocky. I don't want something that has weird internodal spacing. I don't want something. I mean, I have a specific type of plant that I, that I look to make and it's more geared towards indoor cultivation. I want it to have a certain amount of internodal spacing. I want it to have like proper size flowers. I don't want, I mean, sometimes it happens, but I don't want like just giant spear colas like this. You know, it's not 1985. I'm not trying to grow something to put my forearm next to it. Um, I want I like to grow what I consider like proper, you know, two, three gram flowers, like on, you know, on a nice size plant. So the biggest thing I would say would be structure, vigor, um, definitely like the leaf, like how leafy it is. So when, when something is extremely leafy, I think about like what it's going to be to maintain that plant and grow that plant. And at scale, something requires, if it requires a lot more work, it's just not worth it. Um, so I think a lot about that. And then also when it comes time to flower them, um, let's say I've got, you know, 20 males I'm trying to flower, I'll eliminate the first ones to show. I don't want them. And, you know, I don't know if that's something that other people have touched on before, but to me, that's a sign that something is like a little bit more susceptible to having intersex expressions, a little bit less stable. Um, I want something that's going to show a little bit later and I want something that's going to be a little bit more resistant. So, you know, you can be a little bit rough on them. You should be a little bit rough on them. You should see how they respond. And it's, it's tough for me because I, I definitely don't like to abuse them. Um, but I think it's important to see how they respond and to see which ones really, which ones kind of have the widest bandwidth. So that's something that I think about a lot with plants is how tolerant they are. And I feel like that's something that we don't talk about as much. Like not all plants have the same bandwidth and that's just what I call it. They don't all have the same range. They're not all able to take the temperature swings or the pH swings or the nutrient imbalances or, you know, wh whatever it might be, they don't all respond the same way. And so I definitely look for plants that have a wider bandwidth. If, if the pH swings during the feed, you know, and these three don't respond well, I'll eliminate them. Because to me, that says this is a plant that has that needs a really, really specific set of conditions in order for it to thrive. That's a plant that I don't want because that's not what I'm looking for. And I feel like it'll pass those. It could pass those traits on. So why would I keep that plant? So mostly I would say that's probably the biggest thing is just to see how they respond, to look at the structure. I eliminate the early flowering ones. And then, you know, I go from there. One thing I've never done that I'm actually very interested in doing is to reverse a male to see how it produces, what the resin profile is like, um, just a lot of those different factors. And I'm sure you've heard people talk about doing that before. It's been a topic of conversation for years. I know that some people have done it. Um, and I think that's a really interesting way to kind of see which male would be worth going with. And it's something I'd probably like to do on my next project. 
Yeah, I think that'll get you some really interesting results. We've heard a few people talk about it, but it is still very much like a bit of a uncertain thing that hasn't been delved into too much. Um, I did, however, want to ask you in general, what are you currently working on? What are you excited for? Yeah, so right now I'm trying to figure out what I want to do next. We're seeing a lot of the results from the GP6 Tricks project. I had tried to do that High Life project, which did not work out for me. Um, not quite sure what I want to do. I think we may take one of the selections from the GP6 Tricks project to start a new line from. So one of the things we did was that we kept a couple of lines for ourselves and we didn't release them. One was the Gelato 41 GB6 tricks, and the other one was the Biscotti GB6 tricks. And so both of those haven't been released. And I th- right now we're in the process of hunting some of those. Um, Low Key is hunting some of them right now, and I've got a couple going as well. And I think if we're, what we're seeing, we really like. And I think it would be an improvement to that line, and I think it might be a good foundation for a future Femme project. I mean, things are moving so quickly that it's kind of hard to say. Me personally, I would like to do something totally off, off <laughs> something totally off the reservation, as it were, um, like some Honduran or some Guatemalan, or you know, I've got a friend from Colombia, you know, that got me some seeds. I'd be interested in working some of that stuff. But you know, I've you know, in conversations with my friends, one of the discussions we've had is basically it's just like, yeah, no one, no one is going to be interested in that. And so there's the part of me that doesn't really care, and then there's the part of me that thinks, well. Like I do it for me, but I also do it so that other people will grow it. And so I have to consider, you know, what people want. I mean, if I just make something that is of only interest to a handful of us, is it really going to be impactful? Is it really going to make a difference? Are people really even going to grow it? And if they're not, if the answer is no, then why, why make it or why make it at scale? Just make it for myself then if I want and grow it out if I feel like growing it out. Um, but yeah, I would say right now we're probably looking towards working on one of those, uh, or probably a reversal. I have a wedding cake sherb that I really like as well, but sometimes I kind of feel like maybe some of those things, they've kind of had their time. And a thing that I forget is kind of how far ahead of the curve my friends and I have always been. And something that to us is kind of like, kind of like washed, kind of like over it as it were, kind of blown out, um, still has a lot of traction. I mean, people still buy a lot of wedding cake crosses. They still buy a lot of GMO crosses. They still want to grow that. And, you know, back east especially, like a lot of the market isn't even really there yet. Like they're they're still excited about wedding cake. And, you know, wedding cake is something that, you know, hasn't been popular out west in, in a straight form for at least three or four years. I mean, it's something that you see, but it's kind of like become like a, it's kind of become like a staple. It's kind of just become like a thing that's around, but not something that people are really, really excited about. So I think, you know, there's, there's some work that could be done with the Gelato 41 tricks that I think would be good or the Biscotti tricks. I would like to work the Burma tricks potentially and the Lucy tricks. Um, and then maybe go back to do some of the Sherb crosses as well. Going forward though, um, I don't know. We talked about it a little bit uh, that Azazel is something that I think has a lot of potential in it. And everybody that's grown it has been really, really impressed by it. But it's one of those things where, you know, if you called it Apple Runts, people would buy it. But if you call it Azazel, I don't know that people are interested in it, honestly. And it's like, do how much, how much further do I go down that direction? Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean... Let's talk about that for a quick second. Do you like to kind of hunt and go down that route of things that aren't exactly popular? Because like as what we see with the Azazel, most people aren't specifically requesting Vietnamese or Thai or dominant weed these days. Do you feel like as a breeder, you've got to accept a certain amount of kind of commercial loss or just, you know, kind of sales loss from the casual enthusiast? But that then in turn allows you to pursue some of these more niche and truly exotic lines. I I do feel that. And what I find is that the people who are interested in my work are extremely passionate. Um, So I think that I have cultivated the right type of people for what I want to do. But commercially, it's not going to be something that, you know, like an Azazel or Vietnamese or a Thai is not going to be something that necessarily 
is, you know, is, is going to, is going to make a ton of waves. However, that being said, I mean, when you look at the Mac, it's the Colombian in it that, that really surprises people. Um, and it's what gives it that profile, that lemony profile or whatever, whatever you want to call that weird, um, God, how did my friend describe it? Like, a like a raspberry yogurt or something, but the lemon is, is what comes out of all the rest of it, all the crosses. So I think that, you know, I'm going to continue to do what I love to do. I think that there is a group of people out there that appreciate the work that I do. And I do it mostly because I love it. Um, I've always done this because I love it. And I've been grateful to be able to do that. And I've always been the guy that instead of just running one strain, I've run, you know, a dozen. And it doesn't make any sense to people. And you leave a bunch of money on the table. And it's not efficient. and requires a lot more work. But I've always done this because I love to do it. And so I accept whatever comes with that, which is, yeah, maybe you're not going to, you are going to leave some sales on the table. I mean, we did some GMO S1s and they flew, um, a tiny, tiny drop, super small, you know, but they flew. And, you know, the vendor that picked them up said that if I had done, you know, a bunch more of them, they would all still go. But a lot of the other stuff people aren't interested in, you know, if you do, I mean, we did uh, Death Star Cherry Pie with the Mendel Breath UV Wet Dream. And, you know, people that have grown and love it. I mean, somebody grew a Chem 91 Mendel Breath UV wet dream that I made and, you know, told me the herb was phenomenal. I mean, they loved it. But it doesn't have what people want. Like, nowhere in there does it say gelato or sherb or cake or whatever or breath. It doesn't have any of that in there. It's something, I mean, I guess it does because it has the Mendel Breath, but, like, very, very sparingly, not in a way that people would want it. So, when you do decide to go down this route of exploring one of these lines which is kind of more for your own interest than for a commercial success so to speak not that they're mutually exclusive but you know hopefully you get what I mean is it because you have fond memories of some of the components of these lines you're kind of chasing that feeling of the old Vietnamese type strains or is it more so that it's just a really interesting combination of things you don't see often to me it's literally because life is short And I have zero interest in trying to just make a bunch of money and do whatever people expect you to do. Um, I'm going to do what I want to do. And so if I have an opportunity to work something unique and something different, that's what I'm going to do. And, you know, like I said, the people that 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 doing that kind of work attracts are the kind of people that I want to be around. I mean, I've been really, really fortunate to connect with a lot of really good people um, a group out in New Mexico that, you know, super passionate about the work that I'm doing. And one of them is growing the Azazel. And he told me, I mean, his description of it was, yeah, super unique, um, really, really interesting, uh, you know, shorter, quicker flowering, but it has that Vietnamese Thai profile. And that's something that when, when you show it to people, they haven't seen that. They don't even know what that is. There's a whole generation of people that, I mean, honestly, most of them haven't even seen flower. All they do is dab. So when you show them a proper flower, of something like that, it shows, I think, I think it could change somebody's life to see something like that. It could show them that there's more to this than just cookie, 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 cookie. You know, there's like, there's other stuff out there. And I think that, you know, that, that to me is valuable. And the high is different. The effect is different. The terpene profile is different. And I mean, it's something that people nowadays don't see. Like I was saying earlier, you know, a lot of the herb today is very, very narcotic. People are looking for something to basically be a substitute for a pill. And um, yeah, they can find it out there. But I, I don't, to me, it's not always about that. Um, I mean, I've been, I've been blessed to smoke some really, really interesting flower. And, you know, the effects from them can be way, way different. And I don't know that a lot of people have ever had flower like that. Yeah, I would I would agree. It's certainly one of the rarer ones, right? Just not uh probably not last question, but the one before. You mentioned wet dream. This is one I wanted to ask you about because I noticed that Colt Classics used it in some of their lines. Would you be able to fill us in on where you fit in with the wet dream and where they fit in? Yeah, so the wet dream was a project um, that some friends and I had done. We started it, and I mentioned it earlier. It was, you know, from Reef, and then we hit the Blue Dream, and we grew it outside for a couple of seasons. And then I had had some that I had um, flowered out. I was going to try and do another. I, I did. I was on the F three generation of it, and I gathered some pollen, 
um, from it to kind of further the line a little bit more. And I actually uh, gave it, went down and saw my friend NorCal and gave it to him. At the time, he was growing the dog's waltz. And I liked it. thought it was a great plant. Very, very interesting. And so I said, hey, I said, do you mind hitting the dog's waltz and making some seeds for me with it? And he said, yeah, no problem. He has a lot of stuff going on in his life. So he had that pollen. And at some point, he connected with Cult Classics because they, they know each other. And he gave him he gave him the pollen or he – sorry, he gave him – he hit the OGKB and he hit the Mendo Breath. And he gave – Cult Classics, the, the OGKB seeds from, from that project. Um, the next time that I heard about that, because we're all pretty busy, um, somebody contacted me and said, hey, are you working with Cult Classics? And I said, who's Cult Classics? And uh, he said, yeah, he's got a OGKB Wet Dream line that he's releasing. You don't know anything about this? I said, no, I don't know anything about it. So I um, called NorCal and talked to him for a bit. And he's like, oh, man, I completely forgot uh, that you gave me that pollen. He's like, yeah, I'm working with him on, on this seed project and, you know, we're doing the OGKB stuff and blah, 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 this, that, and the other. I had never heard of him. I had never met him. I would not have given him my pollen. This is a conversation that I have had, uh, publicly, I think with him at one point. And, um, but because NorCal is my friend and I figured he would, you know, get compensated from it, Rather than cause a problem, like what's done is done, I just let it go. I had a lot of other stuff going on, a lot of other things that I was working on anyway, so it didn't really bother me. Um, then just kind of like, and I don't want to go too much into his personal issues, but I'll just suffice it to say that like they didn't necessarily, it didn't really work out the way that he wanted it to work out. Um, not to, in all full transparency, not an individual that I've ever wanted to be associated with, a uh, person that I've met one time. And I've never had any interest in further associating with him. Um, I never got compensated on any of that stuff. Never had really any interest as long as NorCal was getting, you know, compensated in some way, shape or form. Beyond that, um, you know, I've seen a lot of people run the work. I've seen a lot of people be excited about it. It is kind of cool to see that because, you know, what they're most excited about is usually the fact that there's no, no intersex issues that have been found in those seeds the size, the vigor, the resin production, the profiles, you know, if anything, I think it's a testament to the work that my friends and I did over the years with that pollen. That being said, it was not ever intended for release, nor did I ever have any, nor would I have ever worked with somebody like him. It's just what happened. And, uh, from there, I would say um, at some point he did give me a couple of the other OGKB uh, wet dream seeds that existed. And he also gave me uh, some of the Mendo Breath UV wet dream seeds that existed. And so I was able to, you know, keep those. And I've used the Mendo Breath UV wet dreams uh, in a line that I did. And, you know, other than that, I would say, yeah, it's kind of cool to see it get out there. He did a hell of a job with the branding and the promotion. But just as a general human being, he's not somebody that I would associate with or would ever want to be associated with. Unfortunately, it's a common sentiment we hear in general when people have this type of thing happen to them. But I guess on the more above board side of things, we see, and you mentioned earlier, that you've been collaborating with Grow Loki in a few projects. Do you plan to do more collabs with them going forward? And do you see collabs becoming like a more popular option in the industry going forward? I, I do. I, I could see people working together more collaboratively. Um, we do intend to do another project together. So right now, I think we're just kind of in the planning phase. Like I said, if he finds something in this recent hunt or I find something, that may be the direction we go down. Um, we've shared cuts back and forth. So there are some potential lines in there. And then I also have a huge you know collection of my own that I could pull from if I was interested. So yeah, we, we definitely plan on working together. Um, he's another one of those guys. He's just a stand up person, somebody that I'm happy to work with and be associated with. And, you know, he shared that tricks with me. That's a plant that he hasn't given to anybody else. So it took, you know, it took a lot of trust in him to give me that and to share it with me and to trust that I wouldn't put it out there you know, without, without, without his approval, basically. So I'm definitely looking forward. And I do think that there is going to be a lot of more collaborative projects going forward. Um, mostly because people are just becoming more comfortable with meeting people and kind of being out there. And so we're meeting people outside of our immediate circle than we would otherwise associate with. And, you know, Loki was somebody that I met when I threw a farmer's market event. Um, we actually threw the first, uh, 
cannabis farmers market in SF and through a, through a delivery service that I had. And, um, he actually came out there. He was super humble. He, uh, came and asked about some Balian flower that I had been posting and growing. And I told him we were sold out cause we were, um, and he didn't say anything. He just walked away. And then he came back with my buddy straight flame and uh, Straight Flame was like, hey, man, this is Grow Low Key, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, oh, man, he, he was much smaller still at that time. But I said, I said, hey, I said, why didn't you say that, you know, why didn't you say you knew Straight Flame or whatever, who you were? And he just didn't want to say anything. But, I, you know, I had a stash of Balian flowers for all my friends. And so I pulled out of there and gave him a bunch of stuff. Um, but, yeah, good guy. And just, you know, like, a, like I said, people are starting to come out, meet more people. I had a couple of friends that didn't want to come to that event because they were pretty sure we were going to get raided. Um, yeah. so <laughs> some people are definitely getting more comfortable because since then a lot of those events, the farmer's markets and the sessions and all that stuff have definitely popped up. And so when you do a collab, what's the ideal collab set up for you? Like, do you like it when say each person brings one parent to the table or do you think it doesn't necessarily have to work like that? Is there a set kind of format you like or just whatever flows happens? I think I think kind of whatever whatever happens. I mean, for me, he had a really nice plant to contribute, and I had kind of the stable that we could pollinate. He also gave me a couple that we could pollinate from his collection. So I feel like that was a really mutually beneficial situation for both of us. Um, I got to pollinate some cuts that were in demand, like the Dubs Garden peanut butter breath, and uh, obviously his tricks and whatnot. And then, you know, he got access to a lot of my genetics, which, you know, I had brought the Gelato 41 and the biscotti um, and whatnot to the table. So that's, you know, one of the def- one of definitely one of the positive sides of just being who we are and where we're from is just having access to all the genetics, whether it's the runts or the gelatos or this or that or the other. Like we've always been some of the first people to have those. Um, so just being kind of first in space and then, you know, getting access to that. And me being able to contribute some things and him being able to contribute from his side of the circle really worked beneficially for both of us. I mean, I have a project going with a friend of mine right now that I'm not going to get into too much. But basically, I sent him some pollen and, you know, he's going to pollinate something that's, uh, you know, super in demand right now. And so we'll see, you know, if people are interested or not interested. Regardless, you know, we're always going to we're always going to keep doing what we like. Cool, cool. That That's interesting to hear. So... Just to jump back to some things we were talking about before, you mentioned that, you know, like Ace Seeds, that you've used some of their work along with Connoisseur. Let's talk about some of these older breeders who often don't get a a good mention. Like Connoisseur is a good one because as far as I can see, he's always done pretty good work, but doesn't frequently get a mention. What was it that drew you to the Grand Doggy Perps and what's your general opinion on Connoisseur genetics? So I love the ChemD and the GDP um, you can't, you can't have lived in Oakland and not appreciate purple. And then the chem, you know, I really appreciated the pairing. I mean, I, I had watched Connoisseur and o- OJD and them, um, working for a while with really just a nice collection of UK varieties, um, like the church and whatnot out there. And, um, also some of the stuff from the States and, it always just seemed like they were doing in, they had, he had interesting pairings that they were working and I know that him and True worked together and they had a falling out which I'm sure you know True may or may not speak on when you speak to him um, but I always thought that they did interesting work and you know especially the perps and the chems and I think they were one of the first ones to do a forum cross it may have been True actually that was one of the first ones to do like a forum cross and actually publicly release it but I liked a lot of that older work. You know, Karma was somebody who did a lot of older work. He's he's still managed to stay relevant, and uh, he's moving definitely and doing some things out here. And um, got some of the older breeders that kind of you know are still out there, Ace and them, um, doing interesting work. And um, Mosca is someone you know that he did some C99 work um, years ago that was all really really solid, old time moonshine work, um, stuff like that that you know didn't really gain a lot of buzz but it was you know good flower i grew a bunch of that stuff and i enjoyed it um i feel like there was just there was more space back then to it's weird there's like more breeders now but they do there's less variety in my opinion it's more people doing the same shit and less people doing more unique work i feel like back then there were less people but they were doing they were doing very very different work I mean, there was always like the Dutch seed banks that kind of seemed like you could just pick one and swap them for the other. 
Um, you know, there was Sagamartha. They were doing different stuff back then. Uh, there was some Peak 19 and a couple other things from them that were interesting. But generally, you know, whether it was Sensi or Nirvana or whoever it might be, they were all kind of on the same thing at that point. Um, even Greenhouse or whatever. You know, Greenhouse had some interesting work back then that people seemed to like. I, I didn't really grow much of it. Um, but yeah, there was there was a lot of just smaller kind of more underground people that were doing it. I mean, even OG Rascal was was doing work back then. People forget that OG Rascal did work like that back then. He does because he doesn't put seeds out now. But you know, I've definitely I've run some of his work. He did Bubba Blue Moonshine and a couple other things um, that people just didn't see. You know, Head Head was another one. You know, he had some Mass Super Skunk Sour D work. Um, Rez, who I'm sure people have talked about before, is another one. Um, you know, whatever, whatever with the situation and the whole story with him. But, you know, the the work, he was one of the first ones, you have to give credit, you know, he's one of the first ones to put a sour type plant out in seed form for people. And you could grow the seeds and find something that was similar or better. You know, I grew uh, Res uh, 4D, the Chem 4 um, with the sour, or 4SD, Chem 4 with the sour. And that was phenomenal, beautiful herb, you know, to this day. That's something that actually uh, Prophet wants to work on. I gave him a pack of the uh, chem sours that I still have that was another phenomenal combination that he made, chem D with the sour inbred line that he was working. So there's, yeah, there's definitely some older breeders. Uh, Swan Song was one. Um, he was from the boards. There was a lot of, there's a lot of people that people are never going to remember. And he did this Limon um, and a couple other ones. And the Limon is something that I used in that Azazel. It's a uh, double sour diesel shit trowel. And it's, you know, it's work like that that, if you weren't around, if you didn't know about it, if you didn't really want it, you were never going to see it. It's not something you could just go and just pick up anywhere. You really had you really had to want it. You really had to look for it. Yeah, and I think some of the best gems are like that. And that brings us to the next question perfectly, where you reference that you know you've used some of Ace's work in your own work. Would you, in general, kind of subscribe to the idea that with Ace, you know, they're breeding with this really kind of untamed, more kind of raw stock. So it's inevitable that you're probably going to get some more kind of wild stuff. You're going to have to put in a bit more of a hunt. Would you agree with that sentiment or do you think it's it's just like most other packs? You know, you probably find a keeper in a pack of 10 type of thing or is it a bit more involved? I think it's a bit more involved. It depends which of their lines you work with. They have some that are very, very open, very kind of wild. And they have some that have been selected a little bit more with the mind of cultivating them indoors or at least, you know, in a semi greenhouse environment. Um, I think the Vietnam black tie was an example of that. I had plants that went, you know, 11 weeks, 13 weeks, 15 weeks. There was plants that just didn't want to stop in there. They were massive. Um, and but I managed to work it and select an earlier flowering one and kind of tame it down. But it takes some work, and that's not something that people want to hear nowadays. They would rather have a candy rain situation than than to actually put the work in. In my opinion, um, they want it done for them. Most people, most people do not have any interest in that. But honestly, that's where some of the most amazing the most unique varieties are going to be found. I mean, if you want to really make something game changing, you're going to have to come out of left field. You're going to have to come with something different. And I just don't know, you know, that you're going to find that in, you know, crossing gelato with dosi dough. Like I just, I just don't see that happening. I don't see how that would happen. Um, especially like, I feel like a lot of the older genetics are fading out. So if you really, really want something different, you do kind of have to pull for something from ACE or, and you know, I know there's a lot of the people that have popped up over the last year or two. Um, God, and I'm going to probably butcher it, but I think it's like the Iranian like seed exchange or something like that. Um, those guys are out there gathering wild seeds, you know, semi, semi domesticated, some wild, you know, but that's, you know, those are gems right there. That's, you know, access to that work is really special. And I know that my, my buddy uh, from People Under the Stairs, Shefro, has worked with some of that stuff. And there's definitely other people out there collecting it and growing it because they, they see the value. You know, I think there will always be those people that want that want to grow something different and something unique. But they're not solely focused on cash cropping. This is like this is a hobby for them. It's not something that they're thinking, oh, you know, I need to get two alight or three alight and it needs to be purple. I need to be able to put it inside a runts bag. Um, they're not thinking like that. They're thinking, you know, 
about a unique experience. And that's what you'll find in the ace gear. You'll find something different. You might not find anything good at all. But if you find something nice, you're going to find something really nice. I mean, I'm stoked to have grown a bunch of those. I don't think that there's a lot of people that, that could ever say that they have grown a plant like that. And I got to grow it and share it with my friends and show them something really, really unique. You know, and I'm grateful to have had the opportunity to do that, to not be under this pressure. I mean, I think about these commercial facilities nowadays, the main ask is, you know, 20% THC, X number of grams per square foot, you know, this number of days of flowering, plants get harvested when they're expected to be harvested on a schedule, not, not when they're ready, not, not when they're ripe, you know, then they got to be tested, then they got to, you know, they got to get packaged. I mean, they get touched so many times along the way that by the time you get it, it's basically been abused. Um, you know, the, the, the times of actually being able to go somewhere and, you know, chop a branch off of a line and put it into a jar for yourself, you know, it's, those days are mostly gone for people. Like most people will never know what that's like. Most people have never seen flower like that. So how could they appreciate, you know, what really makes a special flower special? Yeah, of course. Just to kind of talk about a different older kind of variety, I noticed that you had worked with the Super Silver Haze and that you'd done some crosses with it. Are there any other kind of older strains from these years gone by that you would like to work with? And also, what was the cutting of Super Silver Haze that you ended up using? Was it one of the more known ones or just one you'd found? No, it's it's the known cut. It's it's like the multiple cup winning cut. That's a cut that we've had for a long time. Um, I love it. It's it's a way to one that uh, kind of has a, I don't know. A lot of people in our circle they don't really care for it. They don't really appreciate it. But I love it. And our buddy uh, Wadis, who uh, you know grew it for a long time as well and won a couple cups with it, he. He loves it. We love it. Um, people down in L.A. that get it through our friend's delivery service, they love it. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful cut. You know, I've try, I tried to hunt some Super Silver Haze from, like, more recent stock, and I didn't find anything worth anything in there. Um, so I always revert back to that, to that specific plant. As far as, like, um, newer or older varieties as well that I'd be interested in working in, I'd say I've mostly what I have access to, I've worked with. If I could get anything back that reminds me of, you know, something different, it would be the, there was a plant called lavender, and it's not the Soma lavender. It's it was a Bay Area cut. It might have come out of NorCal. I think it probably did. And um, Mad Farmer actually works with it a lot, and the and the Urkel, and um, I to be honest, like. I've wanted to buy some of those crosses, but me being me, I just want, I actually just want the cut or S ones of the cut so that I could work with it in the way that I want and not have it as diluted. Um, that's a plant that I would actually probably like to work with. That's one of the first ones that I actually started with in the Bay area when I, when I got that cut, um, beautiful plant, great profile, perfumey, like resinous, great full relaxing high to it just a really really beautiful plant and that's probably one that i would like as far as any of the older cuts i would say the romulan if it existed would be something that i would be interested in um the train wreck is one that i've always liked that i know that a lot of my friends are going to listen to that and just shake their heads but i like it and you know i got to the bay after the train wreck had already kind of blown through and so I never really got tired of it because I never really had it to that level. The J1 would probably be one of those as well. Um, I would say the Super Silver Haze is probably the oldest cut, though, out of all those cuts. Um, before that, not, there's not really much else that I can think of that I would actually be interested in. I mean, I know we've worked with some interesting stuff. Um, the Haze, like the PIF, um, is one that some friends of mine have worked with. That's one that I would probably be interested in as well just because I would honestly like to see S1s of it to run through, to see what we find. I think it would be a freak of a hunt. Um, and then beyond that, I mean, I know some friends of mine have talked about the HP 13, and that's one I actually just saw some flowers of that was very interesting, very unique, um, different. You know, there was a sage cut um, by Escobar um, that my friends have grown for a while. That's a pretty interesting one. It's not the sage from TH seeds. It's something else. Um, so that's a pretty, that's a pretty unique one. I mean, those are really the ones that I seek out for my personal 
kind of garden for the stuff that I want to do. Because really, like, you know, like you said, or like I was saying, it's like how many gelatos and dosidos and sherbs can we mix together at some point? At some point, it's just like, really, like, if that's what you're looking for here, we have this and it's basically the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree completely. So when you think about starting a new project, is it all kind of based on feel or do you really kind of think about it? And if you do kind of put a bit more thought and maybe um, kind of writing down your ideas and whatnot, what are, what are sort of the considerations that come into play when you are thinking about starting a new project? So mo- mostly I think about what what the intention is, what the goal is. And if if like I'll give an example is that like we have an orange sherb cut um, that Loki found. It's phenomenal, beautiful flower. But I don't want to do a whole line based on an orange profile. So I won't pick that plant as the basis for the project. Um, I think about really like what what kind of gaps can we fill in that haven't been filled in before and it makes me think about, that's why I think a lot about those exotic pairings because to just take like, you know, let's say we take this, this gelato 41 tricks and I hit it to the gelato 33 and I, or I hit it to the runts or I hit it to the apple fritter or whatever it might be. What am I really actually doing? But for me, that's how I feel. And I know I've had conversations with some of my friends and they say, well, you know, that's what people want. They want to see, you know, the Mac or the wedding cake or the Sherb or whatever they want. They want to know both sides when they see it. Um, Me, I don't think about that as much. Although if I'm doing a collab with someone, I do need to consider that because that may be how they feel. And so I'll be inclined to do a couple for them the way that they would want them to do, which may be more commercially minded. And I'll do a couple for me that I think are actually going to be more unique. And a perfect example of that is I did the green crack with the GB6 tricks and people had no interest in it. But I kept telling people like this is going to be a phenomenal pairing. And a friend of mine is growing them now and they're ridiculous. And the same thing with the Lucy and the GB6 tricks. 99% of people have no interest, care not about the Lucy at all. If anything, like kind of like you may have thought when they see the butterscotch, they think, oh, is that from Canarado? And they're like, oh, that might be interesting. It's from Canarado. Um, but when you tell them it's a butterscotch Hawaiian and is, you know, from Reefer Man and made by some guy named Poor White Farmer, all of that is just noise to them. They're not hearing anything that they, there's nothing that sounds good to them there. And it's unfortunate because, you know, out of a lot of these plants, like the Lucy tricks, the Super Silver Haze tricks, the Burma tricks, the Green Crack tricks, these older kind of, you know, pre-2010 pre whatever varieties that were created by people with not a mind towards commercial production, um, those, are some, those are some phenomenal plants. You know, they're like the pairing is going to be really, really unique. So I think when when I when I do something, I think like, what am I doing? Why am I doing it? And is it just repeating the same thing? If I'm just going to repeat the same thing, then like, what is the point of it? And just make more of the same to do that. I'll just make us ones. I mean, if people really want that, then just take gelato 41 and just make us ones and take gelato 33 and just make us ones. Just do all s ones, you know, just stop reading at all. Just make us ones. And if that's kind of your thing, do that. But that's not my thing. I want to make something that I'm actually interested in growing. Like I'm excited, you know, to I'm excited when I see like I've seen the Lucy tricks and it has the same butterscotch profile as the Lucy, but way better structure, way better bag appeal, much improved yield, like beautiful, beautiful. But it has a distinct profile and my feeling is that because this is being grown by a rec facility, um, when it hits the market, people will not have seen something like that. And that stokes me. Whereas like, yes, people will buy, you know, Gelato 41 tricks if we sold it to them. But and they might not buy Lucy tricks. But I think that if you can get them to try that flower, if you can get them to try that concentrate, like it will become something that they seek out. Because like you were talking about the craft stuff. It's unique and there's no denying something that's different from everything else. It stands apart for, for better or for worse. It stands out. So I think, yeah, when I, when I do a project, I think a lot about kind of just filling in the gaps and kind of moving in a direction that other people aren't moving in. No, I don't really honestly think about a lot of people. I don't really think about what other people are doing at all. 
I, I mean, I should consider probably what the market wants, but at the end of the day, what I have found is that there's enough people that are passionate about the work that I'm doing that I don't need to consider the people who don't want it, you know? And if, and like I said, if I'm doing a collab and they want me to do, you know, for Gelato 41 or Runts or Apple Fritter or something to involve those varieties in there, we can do that. But at the same time, I'm going to go and do my weird thing and cross this Burma that nobody cares about except for maybe three people. And, um, it's fine because it's what makes me happy. It's the seeds that I'm most excited about. When I see a bunch of, you know, Gelato 41 seeds and whatever in my fridge, it's like, it doesn't really do anything for me. I know they're going to be phenomenal. I know they're going to photograph well. Um, you know, I know it's going to look really good. I know it's going to smoke good. I know it's going to have good flavor. I know it's going to, you know, it's going to make people happy, but there's a lot of other things, you know, they could, they could grow jelly breath or dosi lotto or whatever, and it would probably do the same thing for them. Yeah. I get the sentiment, but, uh, I certainly feel like, you know, man after my own heart in terms of, you know, do your own thing and just make the weird crosses that you like. I love that. So the next question I would have is I've noticed that you've done a few crosses using exotic mics work. Where do you rate that? Because I noticed that, you know, Exotic Mike gets a lot of um, praise from a lot of people, but I've also had a lot of friends, like people I know in real life, I've seen it myself, they grow the gear out and there's a surprisingly large amount of Hermes in the gear, you know, I'm probably going to cop some heat for that, but... You know, where do you find his work? Is this just an acceptable risk when you're growing out these types of genetics? And where do you rate exotic genetics in general? Yeah, so from from Mike, I've used the cooking cream cut, um, which is, you know, that, that cup winning cut. And so I've used that one. It's a hash monster. People love that. There's been a lot of requests lately from people um, for for plants that will wash well. And everybody knows that that plant washes really well. Um, so I know that if we cross it, you know, the result will be just that. Um, as far as the, like kind of where I rate Mike and Mike's work, one, I've met Mike. I've spent time with Mike. Um, Mike is a really, really solid person. It's like super humble, really, really good guy. And, you know, you, you're not going to please everyone. Um, in terms of, of there being some intersex expression in the work, I'm not surprised he works with a lot of different plants. There's a lot of cookie stuff in there. Um, even some of the sherb stuff and whatnot is in there. And he does a lot of male, female, uh, regular stuff. I think he's about to drop a feminized line, which would be his first one. And so I think that, you know, from doing that standard male, female, you run the risk of, of seeing some of that intersex expression. I do know though, that, that there's people that are like super fanatical about his work. Um, he's got a lot of people that find gear in there that they just love. And it may just be that, that they find, you know, some intersex expression, but they find some cuttings that they're like, yeah, this one will work. And then they run with it. Um, in that regard, I think it's fine. Mike charges what I consider to be a reasonable price for his seeds. So if you're going to find some intersex expressions, I don't think it's the end of the world because the prices, he keeps the prices very, very reasonable. Um, if you charge a ton of money and the work is unstable, I think that's kind of where like I would draw the line personally. And I also know that, you know, he's, um, he's definitely willing to like work with people. I think if people have issues and whatnot, I don't think he has any issue replacing it or being communicative. Like if he's had problems with certain lines, which I don't know that he has had a huge number of issues, like as far as like with like the cookies guys where they just had to like disappear and some other people that whatever, I don't feel like naming right now. Um, where they kind of just disappeared for a while and popped back up with a new line. So I rate, I rate Mike pretty well and most, mostly because just I've spent time with him and he could have a huge ego and he could kind of be an asshole if he wanted to be, but he's not, he's like one, he's one of the most decent people you're going to meet in this business. So that goes a long way with, with me, like I said, and I think he's pretty transparent with people about the work that he's doing. So, can we expect to see you working with any seed banks going forward? And if so, which ones? Like, what would be important to you about if you were going to be dealing with a seed bank? How would you want to go about establishing that type of relationship? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's tricky. To be honest, I don't really know that that's what I want to do. Um, I've worked with one seed bank before in a limited capacity. It's not really something that's like kind of front and center for me. Um, I have enough people that are like interested in my work that I don't really need to do that. 
And I kind of am cultivating a different type of model than other breeders. Like I'm not really looking to sell um, on a smaller scale to just like, you know, all these different people. And I mean, that's, that is what the seed banks do. I do get requests from people to list with certain seed banks, but there, there's some good ones. And I've, you know, I've seen some people that have worked with some of them before, but it's not really something that I'm really actively kind of seeking out. Obviously the biggest things to me would be just that it, they be stand up, that they be trustworthy and they provide good customer service. I mean, the last thing you want is someone having a problem with them that then affects poor, that reflects poorly on you for working with them. And I'm sure you've seen, you know, there've been some, some fly by night seed banks or questionable practices with some of them, you know, in, in all kinds of ways, whether it's paying vendors or, you know, not, not delivering the, the appropriate seeds or, you know, tampering with the seed packs or all kinds of things that have happened out there over the years. So there, you know, there's some seed banks that friends of mine have had good relationships with. Um, I know my buddy on nonprofit has had a good relationship with seeds here. Now I know my buddy green team has also had a good relationship with them. So, you know, that's somebody that if it, if it lined out, it would make sense, but I'm not sure that, you know, the work that I do necessarily has kind of the commercial profile that they might want. And, as far as like promoting, I don't really do a lot of promoting. I just kind of post what I like and, you know, I just, I am i don't really know that I would be a good partner, honestly, for someone because I don't really care to promote a whole lot. If you looked at my Instagram, it's really just, it's just me just sharing flower and kind of thoughts on things that I like and mostly work that we've been doing or, you know, promoting some of my friends and their work and, uh, you know, just really kind of taking what we had on the forum and just putting it on Instagram, not really trying to, you know, create a whole thing beyond that. It's just, it just kind of is exactly what it is. It's like, these are the flowers. This is what we're growing. And I really use Instagram as kind of like a, like a networking tool to be able to talk to other people about the, you know, I really like facility design. I'm interested in environmentals. I'm interested in lighting. I'm interested in a lot of these other factors and kind of just really improving that aspect of the cultivation. Not so much for like, you know, buy these seeds and they're going to be here and they're dropping here. It's a lot of work to do all that. It's a lot of time and a lot of commitment. Um, I find that I have better relationships with some of the larger farms and enough of my friends kind of run these facilities that I don't, you know, they understand my work. They appreciate my work. And so being able to just kind of work with them enables me to still do what I want to do without having to, kind of deal with things on a smaller scale because there's a lot of blowback that comes from also the people. I don't think people think about that. I think they just are excited to work with a seed bank. They don't think about, okay, the customer service they provide or, you know, this person, this one person had an issue, but you're dealing with hundreds of people or thousands of people. So, you know, there's issues that pop up and kind of like you said, people have had issues with certain breeders and whatnot. And then it becomes like a whole online thing. And it's, it's more energy than um than I think I currently want to you know extend in that direction. If somebody wanted to do like like a small amount and a limited drop or something, I would be inclined to do that, um, but not really like a full commitment to say like yeah I'm going to keep promoting and do all that stuff. I've seen people kind of get upset with with seed producers too for not promoting and not tagging them properly and reposting and all that. I don't, I don't want to get into all that. It's a big, it's just too much to me. It would mostly be like, Hey, if you like my work, great. You can carry it. Um, if you don't care to carry it, don't carry it. It's totally fine. And, um, yeah, but I know, um, like I said, I know a nonprofit has had a good relationship with seeds here now and my buddy from green team as well and a couple other people that I know. So probably would lean, would lean towards working with them if that was the case. Yeah cool i mean it makes sense right so i think we're now on to our last couple of questions before we get to the rapid fire ones at the end so a pertinent question i ask all the guests what is your preferred style of growing and by that i mean are you an organic or more of a synthetic guy how do you do it so for outdoor cultivation i mean number one i when it comes to like the organic versus synthetics i don't really draw a hard and fast line i think there's products from both sides that really make sense i know there's people running like no-till or low-till organic gardens with amendments and worms and they leave the leaves and they do all that and that's dope but indoor that never made any sense to me i grew up indoor cultivating so to me it's always been you know initially it was bottled nutrients and then it was salts um, just to be able to get the cost down. And at the end of the day, like 
I never really noticed a huge decrease in the quality. I have done like fully organic, like amended soil. And, you know, I, I actually like to do that for pheno hunts. It, I think it really gives the plants an opportunity to pull what they want from that. But when you try and maintain this soil and do all that and it's indoors, it kind of becomes a pain. You need a lot more space. Um, outdoor, yeah, the organic soil, uh, like fish emulsions, all that stuff. I've always been a big proponent of that style of gardening for the outdoor plants. I think that they love it. I think there's really something really, really special about being able to cultivate outdoors. Um, I love it. Um, that's definitely something that, you know, that I appreciate about having the chance to spend in NorCal is all those years being able to grow outdoors, um, in spite of the fires and everything else for indoor. Um, I definitely prefer cocoa usually is a preferred medium. I have a lot of experience in rock wool as well. Rock wool is just cleaner. Um, but I kind of like, I appreciate cocoa. I find it to be kind of like an in-between between like rock wool or some kind of, you know, soilless medium or, you know, um, I don't know, amended soil or whatever it might be, a pro mix or whatever that might be with peat, with peat and whatnot. So I would probably say my favorite over the years has been cocoa. I find that, you know, I can grow really large plants in there, um, multiple irrigations per day. And for years and years and years, it was house and gardens, uh, house and garden nutrients, which I really appreciated. And, you know, now I find, you know, you can use Floriflex, you can use Veg Bloom, you can use all of these products. Um, Really, a lot of people, and this is friendly advice to anyone who's listening, a lot of people are getting taxed on their nutrients. Um, at the end of the day, the nutrients are just one component. You can't buy your way out of hard work. So all the equipment, all the tools, all the fertilizer, whatever you, you're spending all this money, but if you're not actually doing the work, I would take a low-tech garden with hard work over a garden with all expensive bottled nutrients and whatnot. It's just, it just doesn't make any sense. If people are listening, don't pay for water. Buy salts. If you're going to do that and if not buy amendments and mix your own soil yeah really solid advice so do you have a favorite product you like to plug at all um that's a good question i would say as far as a favorite product um I don't really think I'm loyal to anybody at this point i mean there's some lighting companies that are pretty decent it's I mean, God, I don't, I honestly don't know. I mean, I would say, ah, uh, man, yeah, I really don't know. I mean, there's, there's some products that I've used, but no one that I would really recommend off top. I would tell people, you know, to avoid Gavita. Um, I could tell people what to avoid more than anything. Do it. Um, do it. Yeah. I would say avoid Gavita, avoid, avoid advanced nutrients. Um, Avoid water-based nutrients if you don't need them. Like literally don't buy anything that's that's mixed with water. Buy Floriflex because it's cheap if you want. Uh, foliar if you need to um, to supplement it. Um, look at what the agriculture industry is doing. And that's, you know, stop buying something just because it has a fancy package on it. I mean, J.R. Peters has a product called Stem. Very inexpensive, tons of micronutrients. But if it was bottled by advanced, it would cost like five times as much, ten times as much. Um, yeah, I would say you know look look into the LEDs and you know compare the compare the different technologies that are out there. There's a lot of people on Instagram right now giving a lot of good information on LEDs, and you know feel free to reach out to the people and ask and learn you know and see learn you know about the value of an adjustable spectrum light and look at, you know, the CMHs, you know, and consider, consider, you know, how you're operating your garden, how you're setting it up and, um, yeah, cleanliness, you know, probably if I was going to plug a product, it would probably be bleach or something of the sort because <laughs> cleaning is fundamental. People do not want to clean. They seem to forget that we're basically like housekeepers and janitors for plants at this point. So keep it clean. And, um, yeah, I don't know. I would say there's there's definitely companies that are worth avoiding out there that would not be worth messing with. And um, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Good call. So just to wrap up our kind of growing questions, do you have any growing tips for the listeners? Or I guess maybe more specifically, do you commonly see people making certain mistakes with growing? What's the mistake you see people commonly doing? Um common mistakes overfeeding is a common mistake trying to buy their way out of out of a problem that they created 
Um, there is no solution to hard work. Pay attention. Um, be diligent. Don't do something when it's convenient for you. Do it when the plant needs it. Um, when you build your systems and you are designing a space, consider all the various factors. Think about where you're going and not kind of what you can afford right now and where you are. And so as you design, as you buy, as you build, um, think about all of that and prioritize the plant. Like I said, no amount of automation, no amount of cameras or sensors or this, that, and the other is a replacement for actually having experience with the plant. I mean, there's a lot of people that have, you know, horticulture degrees, whatnot. They think that they know better than the plant. They think that they can look at a chart and or meter or readings and this and that and the other. And that's that's that actually is what's happening. It's not. When you look at the plant, if you can't tell what's happening, you have not spent enough time with it. I mean, I can if you walk into a room and it feels wrong, if it smells wrong, if the leaf feels wrong, if the if the structure on the leaf looks off, if the general like the general shape form or kind of like the stance of the plant is off, something is wrong in your room. Um, and I think a lot of people, they overlight their gardens, they overfeed their gardens like they do too much and pay attention. Not all strains are the same. Not all cultivars want the same thing. So. Think about that when you're setting up your garden. If you want to design something to be able to grow multiple different varieties, make sure you can have different feeds on each bench or each table. Um, and keep it really, really clean. You know, I think a big mistake that people make is like they, you know, I mean, you're only going to get what you put into it. That's all you're going to get out of it. If there's no, like I can tell when a person has neglected their garden and I've had people watch my garden before and I can tell like they just watered it right before I got back and the plants you know have a little bit of curl on the leaf or a little bit you know they have a little they, you know they're going to dry back and they're going to burn and I don't care what they said I know I know exactly what they did um, but yeah my biggest advice would probably be just you know don't be afraid to experiment but don't change too many variables at once either like you won't know what actually caused the effect be patient and think about what you're doing. Think about whether or not you're trying to learn to cultivate a specific variety. Think about whether you're trying to get experience with different equipment. Think about, you know, whether you're happy with, you know, B-grade buds. And when it comes down to harvesting and drying and curing, like, give it the attention that it deserves. When you run something and put that much time into something and you don't cure it properly, you don't store it properly, like, you're wasting your time. You're never going to see the full potential of that plant. And, um, yeah, yeah. I would just say, just, you know, be diligent, be thoughtful and pay attention, you know, care. And the more you care, the better, the better your garden will turn out. And don't be afraid, you know, to ask questions. Don't be afraid to reach out to people. You'd be surprised, especially nowadays, how helpful some people will be. Like, I'm not saying that inspector is going to answer your message if you ask, but he might. And, you know, I think a lot of people too, they, they want to, they want to be great. They're afraid, they're afraid to make mistakes and understand that, all of us made mistakes. All of us have ruined a bat. All of us have flooded a room or, you know, inserted a bulb improperly or whatever it might be. All of us have done it and we've done it multiple times. Um, and be diligent with your IPM. Be diligent. If you, if you think it doesn't matter and you start taking a day here, a day there and skipping this or skipping that, I promise you it's going to bite you. And it's going to be months of cleanup and you, that little bit of time that you neglected is going to come back to bite you in the ass every single time. You can always look back and see where you were lazy and it will come back and bite you. Yeah, some phenomenally solid advice right there for all the growers looking to improve their game a bit. So last question before our little quick fire round. We can see that there are more and more states coming online regularly and we can also see that it's really hard to find good flower in the majority of these states. Like for example, you know, in on the East Coast in places like Mass, like I can only think of like two people where I'd be able to get good flower from them and that's like Mass Medical and then like ChemDog slash that guy from Maine. Those guys are obviously crushing it. So I guess my question is, for people who are from these smaller states, just coming online is really no established scene. I, mean, I know I know that Mass has a bit more of an established scene than most places, but I digress. If you're from a state where there's less of an established scene, it's hard to find good flower, what are some tips for 
the kind of communities in these places to just lift the, their game and produce better quality flour and get up to scratch with the West Coast, for example? Well, I'm going to have kind of a defeatist attitude, I think, about the recreational market, at least out east for a while. Um, this market is going to be dominated by by the big players, by the people that have the deep pockets. So if your goal is to try and produce a higher grade quality flour, I honestly think that the best you could hope for is probably like a cheesecake factory level of flour um, where it's good. But anybody who knows something phenomenal, something truly special will never be impressed by it. And the, the big reason why is because of everything that goes into it in terms of how it's harvested, how long it sits. Um, it goes out for testing, then it gets jarred up, then it goes and sits on the shelf. There's just such a gap in between that scene and when it actually hits the market that the flower is just going to be like degraded by the time a consumer actually gets it. So if you're used to getting something really phenomenal and high end, it's going to be really, really tough. As a producer, um, there are states that are more friendly. I think Maine is one of those states that seems to be that like smaller producers can kind of get more into the market there. So that might be worth considering. I do think that, you know, try, I mean, if you really, really want and you're really, really committed to actually producing for the market, like on the recreational side, you're going to have to raise some capital and try and make a run of it and be willing to fight tooth and nail for, you know, three, four, five years. Um, and I don't know that there's a ton of people that are willing to do that because the biggest producers on the medical side of the market they're not going to want to make the transition. A lot of people, I saw that happen in California. Not a lot of people have transitioned successfully through 64. A lot of people disappeared. A lot of people are not made to exist in a corporate structure. They're just not built for it. It's a whole different beast of a situation. And I also think, um, to be completely blunt, like the re the amount that people get paid by these facilities is not equivalent to what they were earning. So a lot of a lot of the most talented growers are not going to want to work for these facilities. And I guess a big thing is that, like, if you are a grower, are you capable of operating in, in a, in a semi corporate environment? Because whether you like it or not, that's what you're doing. You know, you're analyzing costs, you're managing people, you're dealing with, you know, unemployment and payroll and all of this stuff that that's not why a lot of people got into it. So I think, you know, I think in a few years after all of this settles, there will be an opportunity for some of these smaller craft places to pop up. And, you know, I'm very, very much looking forward to that because I just don't think that it should cost that amount of money to and require that much security and that much tracking and all of these crazy things to be able to, you know, grow an eight lighter and, you know, have a small, I mean, the equivalent of a, of a small craft brewery. It just, it shouldn't, it shouldn't be that much different from that. In terms of, you know, they don't have to have security in front of their spaces. They don't have to have cameras in every corner. They don't have to pay all these exorbitant taxes. And they let them pop up pretty much anywhere, you know. For for us, you know, it's hard, I think, for a lot of guys to make that transition, for a lot of people to make that transition. If you can get enough people on the same page, you can try and make a run at it. But if you're looking to produce higher quality. I mean, I don't honestly think that we're going to see the level of the quality of flour that we saw in the medical days in California on the rec market for a long time. I think best case scenario, a lot of the flour that's on the market is B grade. I think a lot of the oil that's on the market is better because the oil is processed so quickly and then it doesn't get, it's more, the BHO that they're making in, in California is an example from the fresh frozen material it's a lot easier to preserve it and bring it to market in a stable state where it still has a really, really strong terpene profile and it still has a nice solid effect. If the flour isn't stored precisely all along the way before you get it, it's going to be an inferior product. I mean, I've seen shops in Oregon like that where it's, you know, it's 80 degrees in there and they've got the jar sitting there in full light. And when you ask them, you know, if they understand about oxidation and temperature and the terpenes, you know, and they, they don't, they had no clue what I was talking about. So I think that, you know, for the quality scene on the East Coast, I think that there are people producing quality flour, but I think a lot of them are going to stay medical. A lot of them are going to stay underground. And I think there probably are some facilities that are trying to produce higher grade flour, 
But at the end of the day, a lot of the people that are bankrolling these facilities, that's not really what matters to them. They're just looking to grab market share, make revenue, you know, and they, they, they just want to recoup their investment and potentially flip their business. Um, hopefully, you know, California will see some brands that survive and exist. I know some people out there that are uh, doing, you know, that are fully intending to do good quality work. And I think if a market could sustain that, it would be a larger market like California. Yeah, of course. And you just raised a really interesting point that I want to touch on for a second there. Have you ever met a bud tender who legitimately impressed you with their knowledge? Oh, wow. No. Um, right. Even at, even at our- yeah, even at Archive, I've met some people that were like knowledgeable, you know, and they were pretty passionate, but nobody that ever really impressed me with their knowledge. And this is no this is no disrespect to anyone, but if you knew that much about this, if you were that passionate about this, like is that really where you would be? Like Yeah. Like the reason why I bring it up is because I got sent an email and there was some like event like for is like the Bud Tender Awards or something and they were like, Oh, would you would you like to come and document it? And obviously they don't realise I'm in Australia. But more importantly, like all I was thinking to myself is like, what would I be documenting? Like the mediocrity? Like I like yeah, like I've I, I'm disappointed by Bud Tenders consistently. It's like just the most passe thing to do if you're superficially into cannabis yeah i had i had to explain to, so i went into one dispensary i had to explain to them i asked if they had any live resin and they said oh we've got this and i was like well that that's co2 and they were like oh but yeah but it's live i was like no no like i said that's not what i'm asking about i said do you have any like fresh frozen material like bho extract i'm like that's the only way it would be like that and I had to explain to them the difference. And then one of them asked me, hey, you know, you know, you know a lot about cannabis. Well, like, do you want a job here? And I, I'm not, not to be rude, I laughed. Um, but not, not like that, but only to say like, no, like um, this is my life, this is my whole upset. I don't have to get into it with them, but like you should know that. You should know the difference between live resin and butter and sugar and wax and BHO and CO2. It's really not that complicated. Like... All you need to do is care to educate people. But the reality is, like I said, about the companies that are running these places, the bar is so low. They pay so little. They care so little about the training and kind of helping build these people up. Just like most companies, they don't really care about building up their employees. Why would they care? So they, you know, unfortunately, most people that come in, what if you've listened, all they say is, what's the highest THC thing you have for the least amount of money? That's literally what people are interested in. Like... Yeah. That, that's it. You know, and the, the the test results are a whole other thing. You know, that's like, I mean, some states are more strict than others, but at the end of the day, you know, there's been stories, you know, out of Washington and other places with labs completely faking test results, and um, it's kind of unfortunate. Like we live in a THC kind of dominant society. People really just only care about the majority of the customers that come in just care about the THC level. You know, and if it's 30%, it sells faster. If it's 25, it sells fast. If it sells 20, great. If below 20, they're not super interested. Yeah, it's it's interesting, right? I, I remember hearing that uh, one of the testing companies, I can't remember who it was, and I, even if I remember it, I probably wouldn't want to say the name, but that they were like, you know, you'd pay for the test and then you'd also pay a little extra fee if you wanted it to test over at like, you know, 26 or something. I was just like, oh, yeah, cool, cool. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, that's. I mean, people people have shopped around for testing companies, like to see who will test higher, because they know that they'll they'll get a higher ticket for that. Yeah, so it's, you know, that's I've really seen it. interesting, but also sad, but not unexpected given where we're at. Anyway, on to our last little run of questions, what I like to call the quick fire questions. So these ones, um, you know, feel free to answer them as quickly or as long as you'd like. First one, what's your favorite weed that you've ever smoked? Wow. Um, Probably this, the Cali Mist we used to get in San Diego in like early 2001, 2002. Wow, yeah, that that sounds like a really nice throwback. Yeah, it was phenomenal. It was beautiful. You could smell it in the air no matter if somebody was smoking it wherever they were smoking it, you could it was distinct. It had an incredible high 
that was super clear. You felt lifted, but clear. No, no tiredness, no anything to it. Really, really beautiful. And then the other one was honestly some some Willie Nelson that they had at Harborside. I used to vend to Harborside, and I went in there one time, and they had bought a pound of it, and I. God, I think they paid like six or seven thousand for it at the time, and when pounds of sour were going for thirty six, thirty four, significant. Um, but they gave me some of it, and the high from that was phenomenal. I mean, really, really, really special flower. It never made the shelf. They split it up amongst themselves back there. Interesting stuff. Okay, so on the opposite end of the spectrum, what's the worst weed you've ever smoked? And the follow up is. What's the worst weed that you've smoked that somehow got commercial traction and other people seemingly thought it was pretty good? Wow. The worst weed that I've ever smoked was probably the brick weed I smoked in Miami when I was like 16. Um, (laughs) Since then, I've been like, no, um, I won't do that. Um, The worst weed that's gained commercial traction is probably the Mac or the Purple Punch, either one of those. Yeah, two two contenders that we've heard before. Actually, no, we haven't heard the Mac. We've heard Purple Punch, but there you go. A new one bringing Mac to the the worst commercial one. But I, I see where the merit is. So the next one is, if you're stranded on a desert island, you can only take three strains with you. What three are you going to take? Wow. Probably the Chem D. Uh, probably the TK and probably like the lavender um or some something along that line of the of the old perps i'd probably say because that that would i mean i'm gonna miss the sour but i think i think if i combine the 91 and the uh or if i combine the tk and the d i could probably get something that i like in there (laughs) (laughs) i love it and you just wave goodbye to sativas at that point hey (laughs) i'm on an island It'll be, everything's going to be fine. Yeah, lovely. <laughs> okay, so the next one is, if you could have back one clone that you had lost or a clone that you'd wanted but were just never able to get your hands on, what one would it be? Wow. Um, um, probably that lavender, honestly. It's, I just have a fond space for it. I've never I haven't had anything like it in my garden since. It would probably be that that lavender. Yeah, it's a really special plant. I've been lucky enough to be able to smoke some grown out by Duke, and it's uh, very very memorable. Nice, lucky indeed. So, on to our very last question: If you could go back in time to any place, any time frame throughout all of history, to presumably get some seeds or a clone, where and when would you go? Wow. Um, man. Hmm. Probably Colombia. I think, I think that a lot of interesting work has come out of there and it would have to be before we started traveling around the world and polluting the genetic gene pool. <laughs> um, probably some of the Colombian and if not, Mm, if not the Colombian, some of the Asian stuff, like something something out in Thailand or Cambodia or Laos, I think would be really, really phenomenal flower, all things being equal. So I'd probably aim, aim towards one of those, both kind of with the same intention, really looking for something with an incredibly like psychedelic, uplifting type high. Yeah, fantastic. Sounds like something I would consider doing. So, with all that being said, do you have any shout-outs or comments you'd like to make? Um, I would say, if anything, I just want to shout out all my friends. I really appreciate them. I'm super grateful for everything that they've done for me over the years. Um, a good friend of mine who really helped me a whole lot when I landed in Oakland and didn't know anybody and didn't have anything and really looked out for me and knew a lot about growing, knew a lot more about growing than I did at the time. And now, you know, he calls me for advice, um, but still one of one of my greatest friends and I super appreciate him. And then my, my buddies from ICMAG, who I would not be here without, um, my buddy Stoney, uh, my buddy Frost Boss, my buddy Prophet, my buddy NorCal, my buddy DZ. 
um, just all all the people that I kind of came up with and that made opportunities for me and gave me a chance. Um, when I was just trying to make a run of it out west, a lot of these guys were born and raised out here, and you know they didn't have to extend any hospitality or do anything of the sort, but they definitely gave me a lot of opportunity. And a couple of my friends from Chicago um, who were basically the reason that I thought that this was possible and were the ones that it convinced me to come back to the West Coast after I tried the first time and it didn't work out and gave me an opportunity and kind of just plugged me with, with the right people and, you know, were always there to kind of help me even when I couldn't afford to pay them. Um, just really, you know, super grateful. And honestly, for my mother and my grandmother, who, in spite of me being completely insane in their eyes, have always supported me and encouraged me and never told me that I was incapable of doing something. And that's probably the best advice that I would give anybody who's actually taking the time to listen to this is that you are completely capable of doing it if you, of whatever it is that you want to achieve, if you're willing to apply and work and work and single-mindedly focus on something. And be be good people. Don't let people take advantage of you and give give what you get. Some really, 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 really solid advice there. So just again, a big thank you to Ghost from Always Be Flowering for coming on the show, for setting the record straight and for all the knowledge bombs. Absolutely, man. Thank you very, very much for having me. I really appreciate it. No problem, my friend. Well, there we have it. Another fantastic episode. A big, big, big thank you to Ghost for taking the time to come on today. Sharing all the awesome knowledge and insights. And a big, big thank you for you guys for sticking around. My Patreon crew, what is up? As always, a big shout out to you guys. You're amazing. I appreciate you so much. And you know who else I appreciate? Seeds here now. Radio Ridge Nursery. 420 Australia. An organic gardening solution. These guys are the best sponsors in the world. They do God's work in my opinion. Go check every one of them out. Likewise, check out Always Be Flowering. Hit up Ghost. Get some of those seeds. Big thank you again to Green Sleeves Merchantile. Love Papa Lucas, my man. Doing the best designs. Check them out, guys. Big, big, big love as always, Dragonfly Earth fam. Check out that regenerative message. If you don't know what it is, it's time to expand. Hope you're ready for another episode. I'll see you for the next one. I'll see you.